Hey guys, Bobby Thompson here with another episode of Jiu-Jitsu and Coffee. And today our guests are Brendan Secor, Alex Abreu, and Tom Gibbs. Secor. Chuck. Secor. Secor. I got to get that down. We're going we're gonna to keep it going. So we're going we're gonna to start today by uh, introducing Tom, who's been training with us for a while. So uh, Tom, how long have you been training Jiu-Jitsu? Um, I trained for about six months in Alaska, probably three or four months total training because I had some injuries that set me back a little bit and then I've been here about a month and love it. Uh, my son's been doing it closer to a year now, a little bit longer, so I've been kind of involved in it a little bit longer than that, but yeah, it's uh, addictive. Well, welcome to the show. Don't be nervous. All right. If Thank you feel you something Thanks touching under the table, uh, you know, just let it happen. You'll see a big smile. <laughs> you'll know it's happening. Um, so have, have you always, Alex, gay jokes get him every time. <laughs> He's just giggling. Um, now, how, how long have you always been into jujitsu? Like before you trained, were you into jujitsu? Like were you into that scene, the fight scene? Like, I, you know? I was. I grew up in uh, martial arts as a kid, karate. My uh, uncle in Alaska was a tank sudo instructor. So uh, about high school, I kind of quit training, but I'd always go and spar with those guys. And then I watched the very first UFC live actually lost a bunch of money on it that's another story but uh and it was amazing you know when i saw what hoist did and no one had ever heard of jiu-jitsu and it was just it was amazing and i'd always uh, i'd always wanted to learn it um you know life kind of has this way of getting in the way you have a career and a family and everything else but once uh got my kid to join it i wanted to help him i, I love working with kids i coach his t-ball and little league and even though I never played baseball, but I still, you know, I just like always like working with kids and stuff. So wanted to help him, but I didn't want to teach him anything wrong, and I didn't know what I was doing. So that gave me that extra incentive to finally pull the trigger and sign up. And so, yeah, now every single night at the house, it's full-on jiu-jitsu matches, which, uh, you know, for the record, my kid's undefeated lifetime against me, if you ask him. <laughs> nice. Uh, so, yeah, I just want to learn and learn for myself and learn and help my son and really excited to uh, – to do a tournament someday and just just love learning you know the first uh my first jiu-jitsu practice i went up against one of our black belt instructors who is 145 pounds you know and, and obviously he's a black belt i didn't think like i could beat the guy but i mean i got 70 pounds on him you know in my mind i'm thinking well okay worst case scenario i pick him up and throw him against the wall right like i'm twice this guy's size and i put a hand on him that guy would snap my wrist <laughs> you know and it was uh it's amazing, you know. It's really amazing. The art is, uh, it's so effective, you yeah. know, that it's right. really, really something. How? Something um, I'm learn. just curious now. You, the who who was the team you trained with up there? What was it called? Uh, Anchorage Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And and what? Uh, like who 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 were they affiliated with? I believe the lineage is under Marcelo Garcia. I think yeah. so. Yeah, it's uh, pictures on the wall were uh, Helio Gracie. Marcelo and then uh, the instructors, yeah. the head instructor, and so on. So now, um, how, do they do it very different than we do it, or is it pretty similar? Or it's it's similar. Um, it's a little bit different the way the the class is set up. You know, they do a lot of uh, a lot of training, like what you do with the kids. They do for the adults as far as you know. You're doing elbow escapes up yeah. and down the mat. You're doing push ups and sit ups and. Uh, they're, they're also trying to get you in shape where you are like, well, hey, you guys get in shape on your own. You're here to learn. Um, it's a little more regimented as far as uh, a little more military style, I, I guess you could kind of say, you know. Like I was saying here, like the, the sparring is a little more relaxed. You know, you can, if you wanted to stick around for half of it and, or if you're tired and you want to sit out for 10 or 15 minutes, you know, there was a, there was a timer. It was seven-minute matches. You got one minute to catch your breath and then you have to find another partner after a minute if you don't have another partner they're in your face get on the mat and fight you know what i mean yeah. so uh which which is kind of good and bad you know one thing uh you learn a, a bit about yourself you know when you first start it's so exhausting that i mean i thought i was going to die right like I, I cannot continue anymore and then but you realize you can't yeah even out of breath tired covered in sweat you can still fight obviously you're not at your best but you know you realize you can still defend yourself where uh I mean, any other sport, you know, it's like, give me a sub, a timeout, <laughs> you yeah. know, like, right. I can't even breathe right now. And, and then they would just make you keep, keep going back out on the mat. But, uh, but then again, also, you know, got some injuries because of it, too, you know, so. 
Yeah, um, there's there's no one in this sport that's healthy. Like yeah. if you do this for any period of time, it's it's the hardest thing on your body. Um, but you know, back to the back to what you were um, saying about how we train. Uh, I, I came up that way too, where we had 20 or 30 minutes of calisthenics and we, we, I had my first instructor put us to the ringer, man. It was like, you were, you were soaking wet. You were doing all these froggers and jump squats. And I, I don't even remember the names of all these things, but we had yeah. like 30, 30 different stations we'd go through. And I was like, fuck this man. Right. I, I was trying to work out. Right. So like, yeah. you can imagine leg day I'd come and I'd like, Oh, you're kidding me. I got to do that. And I hated it. Like I, I'm like, bro, I just want to learn jujitsu. That's what I'm, right. that's, that's what I came for. That's what I'm paying yeah. for. Just teach me jujitsu. So I always said, if I taught, I would do it differently because I, I never appreciated those 30 minutes. I still don't. I still, I still feel it's kind of a waste of time. You're not learning. I don't care what people say. You're never going to convince me you're learning anything from that. It's uh, yeah, you're, you're creating, you're, you're getting the person in shape, but that's up to them. Alio wasn't an athlete, right? Ask anyone, right? Yeah. That's if you want to talk about the, 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 the roots of jujitsu and the heritage of jujitsu, Alio wasn't an athlete. You don't have to be an athlete. I'm not an athlete. I'm the weakest black belt. I mean, I'm, I'm freaking weak. I'm going to tell you right now, but you know, I hold my own, right? Uh, you don't have to, you don't have to, ha I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I used to, I used to have some mass on me and it was nice. Like th there ain't no question about it. Like strength helps. There's, but your neon belly is a killer and, and it forces a lot of farts. <laughs> but, but it's not, but it, that's not the focus, right? Like that's kind of cheating in a way. It's not, that's not what God gave me. And, you know, one day I woke up and I was like, man, I, you know, this, this isn't, this isn't me. And, uh, I, I just started focusing on jujitsu. But, um, but yeah, some, some schools, I can't, I, I, I don't appreciate going to those schools where you have this 20 or 30 minute workout. And I just said, I also wanted people that were 50 and 60 to be able to start jujitsu with me and finish, you know, and get, and get a black belt. Right. I, I wanted, appreciate it. And I do. I mean, I'm, I'm a heavy guy. I mean, I, yeah. I do like to do cardio. I do like to exercise, but I feel like I get the, I get it done on the open mat. You know, like I, my, yeah. my core is built, my, I'm building core strength. I'm, I'm sweaty and exhausted by the end of the night and I've got a great workout, but I've got an hour <coughs> worth of technique. Um, and I feel like I'm getting my money's worth. So, so what you're doing, I, you know, yeah. I, you I, ask I, me, I think, I think it's 100% the way to go. People don't like yeah. it. I, when Henry was teaching on Tuesdays, there was a core of us that would purposely come in late to skip the calisthenics he yeah. would do. And it was little stuff he did. It wasn't even a lot. And I understand it. Yeah, we would skip. Like, we would come I later. I understand it. It's like, it's like bu you know, I look at it like it's bullshit. Like, I don't want to shrimp out down the mat. It's not making me better with it. You can tell me it is. You can go, yeah, it's going to be. For the kids, we do it, and we, you know, maybe they are learning the mechanics a little bit, but we're really getting them in shape. You know, we're getting, yeah. you know, we're getting the kids in shape. We're, we're tiring them down for the parents a little bit so they sleep better at night, you know. Uh, some of the kids come in because they are out of shape. You can see some of the kids are, and the parents are kind of hoping that they'll, you know, tone up a little bit. So <clears throat> it's a little bit different with the kids and they don't have injuries and they have lots of energy. So yeah. it, that's, it's a, it's a little bit different, but you know, when you're taking, I've, I've got parents that are in their forties and fifties that come in, they did a hard day's work. They want to learn how to defend themselves. They want to learn how to grapple like a black belt, you know? And I think you can do that without all the calisthenics. And I, and I think I've proven that you can. So, uh, I don't know. That's my take on yeah. it. Yeah, time better served, you know. And if if it were if it were wrong, then a then a seminar would be worthless, right? It, all these people pay hundred, you know, hundred hundred fifty dollars, whatever, and they'll go to a seminar, and you'll get ten moves or something like that. Like you'll sit there and and if if it were wrong, the way I'm doing it, then a seminar would be worthless. You can't tell me that um, learning ten moves is wrong. Is that is that it's not beneficial? Then then no one should go to a seminar. You know, um, anyway, so man, you moved here from Alaska. Yeah. Yeah. I just, uh, got here three months ago. Kind of, we'd been wanting to move for a while. My wife's from Hawaii. Never really liked living in Alaska. And well, that's didn't... night and day right there. Yeah, man. it your is. Wife's <laughs> from Hawaii. You all are, your well, wife's a military Hawaii. brat. So she, she moved, uh, to Kentucky when she was four or five or something like that. And then, uh, ended up in Alaska. 12 or something lived there ever since and never really liked it and I, I mean I like aspects of Alaska the summer it's just so short and the winters aren't really really uh worth putting up with it for you know so uh finally everything was just it was just time to go so didn't really know where we wanted to move so many cool places so many places we've never been so finally 
we were thinking about it, you know, doing research, thinking about a bunch of different things. And finally, I was like, you know what? Let's sell everything, jump in the motorhome. We'll just go for a drive. We'll either find a place we love or maybe it'll break down and we'll just, <laughs> that'll be the sign, right? Like, we'll just end up somewhere, you know? And My Cousin Eddie. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so you, you so, grew up your whole life in Alaska. Yeah, born and, and raised. And then you just jumped in a motorhome and went to find a new place to live. <clears throat> yeah. Just That's said, brave. And how long, yeah. did, how long did that last? To well, we, we spent, uh, we turned it into a vacation, so we spent uh, two months traveling all over. Uh, we hit every national park. We were, you know, east coast, west coast, every, you know, visiting friends and That's family. Um, just, just, I just had a great time. Uh, a lot of beautiful places in the world, for sure. You know, that was one thing that really kind of stuck out to me is everywhere you went, you're like, you know, places you wouldn't even think of. And you're like, oh, my gosh, this place is awesome. And you start doing research, you know, oh, maybe you want to live here or there. And so we kind of checked everything out along the way. I really wanted to get over to this side and uh, check out Florida and the Carolinas, which I liked all of them. Um, but, you know, with the economy is much stronger here in Florida, much better schools, you know, were kind of the determining factor of why we picked Florida over, you know, like uh, really like Charleston, South Carolina. And, yeah. You know, there, there's a lot of cool places, you know, for sure. So uh, Why Jacksonville? Well, we do ball, brother. That's right, because of you guys, man. I heard about you guys. I wanted to come meet you. Was watching the podcast up in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I've been gonna get more Jacksonville, Jacksonville well, for a while. We wanted a beach. We wanted weather, and, uh, and like I said, with the economy and the schools here being really strong, uh, kind of fell in love with St. Augustine. Okay. So we set up camp in St. Augustine and uh, started looking for jobs. I didn't want to buy a house or rent or you know anything like that until we kind of knew where we were going to work so got a really good job offer for a great company in Jacksonville too far to commute from St. Augustine so that's why we uh, came up and started looking at Jacksonville Beach and Atlantic Beach and pulled the trigger and uh, couldn't be happier man this place is it's cool and I, I love I love the southeast I love the southern hospitality I think there's a lot of friendly people here that was a big thing to me I want my son to grow up around you know, friendly people and, you know, a good environment. And, uh, yeah, uh, no regrets. One, one regret is that uh, I didn't do it, you know, 10 years sooner, honestly. But that's about it. That's, that's interesting. I always thought about possibly moving or retiring to Alaska. Like the, the what I think is super cool, like what I think would be the coolest job of all, of all jobs. Um, there's a series on, I, I can't remember now because it's been a while since I watched it, but I think it was called 10 Star and it had Eli Rock something Roth in it. I think it's Eli Roth. The director? No, he was the something Roth. I think it was Eli. It might not be Eli, but he was the, he was the cop, you know, but uh, it's called 10 star and it was really good. This was in Canada, right? The same thing. Canada to me, very similar. It's like yeah. just, um, but everyone knew him in the town. It's like that. That's like kind of cool. It's like, you know, in your town, everyone knows everybody. It's super small. Tim Roth. Tim Roth. Yeah. There you go. Thank yeah. you. And, uh, you know, you have all this nature, and I imagine a lot of, um, I just imagine it being low to no stress. That's what I imagine Alaska being, low yeah. to no stress. And honestly, if you could if you could afford or figure out how to do the snowbird thing, live in Alaska in the summer and, you know, Hawaii, Florida, somewhere in the winter, um, that, that would be the ultimate dream for sure, you know. Uh, but the problem is, you know, the small town Alaska, the, the low stress places, there's, there's no money to be made. There's no work, you know what I mean? You can... What about, now, when, when I watch the, you know, I forget the names of the shows, but like Alaska State Trooper, I think that's one of them. That paints us in a good light. Yeah, what you see, <laughs> yeah, what, what you see is a lot of druggies, and yes. like drugs, really, and like, mur like I guess, murders and drugs and yeah. shootouts, and I mean, is it is it pretty safe Suicide. there? Is it pretty... Uh... No, it's out of control, honestly. it's. Uh, I think last year Anchorage was rated the number one most deadliest city to live in per capita in the United States. The last uh, 10 years, it's really gotten out of control. There's always been a lot of drugs in Alaska anyway. It's dark. People are depressed. You know, it just kind of, you know, it just promotes that, I guess you could say. But um, it's it's gotten bad the last the last five years especially it's gotten out of control i mean home invasions i think there was we averaged like 20 vehicle thefts a day in anchorage or something ridiculous like that i mean it's nuts like uh, half of everyone i know has had their vehicle stolen and their house is broken into and uh you go to downtown anchorage and there are tweakers everywhere just walking around scratching themselves and tweak i mean just drug addicts and junkies all over the place and the state's broke right now like really bad they uh 
there's no taxes in Alaska and with the oil prices declining, they've uh, ran out of money, they cut the police force, they cut everything. And they started uh, not, not even incarcerating people. I mean, if you, if you didn't commit a violent crime, they just let you go now. They don't even bother arresting you because it just costs them money. You know, you can go and rob right. people, and they're just like, oh, well, we don't have proof. If you have warrants, if it's not a felony warrant, it, go ahead. Seriously, and you know. A friend, of like mine, friend of mine got his uh, truck stolen, and the guy grabbed That's his nice. checkbook and goes to the bank and writes a check for ten grand. Well, the bank calls him, cops. He shows up. Where'd you get the check? No, oh, someone gave it to me. All right, you can go. Dude, my buddy about lost it. He's like, you know, he's like going to kill the guy. He's like, that dude stole my truck. He's got my check. You know what I mean? He, now he's trying to rip me off for 10 grand. Cops are like, bro, judge is going to throw it out, man. Can't afford to put him in jail anyway. We can't pay for it. You know, and it's, I don't know. Alaska, uh, when I was a kid, it was just a, a great place to raise a family. And that's kind of deteriorated. So that was another big factor in us wanting to leave. So, yeah. <clears throat> That's so it's not even a place to visit, just like maybe stop through and... It's a great place to visit. I, I, it's just Anchorage. Like the rest of Alaska is still cool. It's just hard to live there, you know? Like, yeah. like my buddy uh, Sitka is one of my favorite places in all of Alaska. It's gorgeous. It's such a cool place. But there's no work there. And like my buddy that lives there owns a fur gallery. So the, the cruise ships come through and he, you know, sells overpriced furs to tourists and makes tons of money. Well, I'm not... That's not me. I'm a construction guy. There's nothing yeah. to build there. There's nothing... <clears throat> You know what I mean? You couldn't open a jiu-jitsu studio there. There's no IT to do. Uh, you know what I mean? There's no hospital. You know what I mean? There's there's one cop. You know, none of us would be able to find a job in Sitka or any of the other places. You know what I mean? So, uh, like I said, great place to visit. It's beautiful. It's uh, a lot of character, a lot of cool things to do. But uh, it's it's a tough life, you know? I mean, it's, it's yeah. different. You know, the winters, you, some mornings you wake up and you're like, oh, it's not a foot and a half. Like I can't even get my truck out of the driveway. You got you got to shovel your whole driveway for forty minutes before you before you can even get out to to make it to work. Or, I hate snow. You know, I miss it. I, I haven't seen it. Yeah, I, I do. Fifteen it's, years it's, or something. Maybe twenty. You don't have to go too far though. I mean, what, like North Carolina. Yeah, I think. I just, I just miss it every time we go. Like we'll go somewhere in December or January, and we, we I haven't seen snow in like twenty years. It's like a toothache. <laughs> you miss it, but once you have it, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. I hate oh, snow. Yeah, I'm, me and the girls. When it's cold. You miss a toothache? Yeah, like, you know, like, that saying, yeah. like, man, where's that pain? Like, it's not there anymore. That, that's an expression. I don't think so. I think no, you're I just making so. up expressions. What? Henry. <laughs> Henry. I'm going to go. I'm, I mean, I'm going to be the fact checker here. Um, toothache. <laughs> I miss you I like think a you're toothache. Off on that. I think you're you, off on you've that You've never one. heard that expression? No, never. I think that means, like, I don't okay, miss Ricky. you. Yeah. Like, what, what does that mean? What, Ricky? Yeah, no. <clears throat> Henry. It was like another, it was a Henry comment. Henryism. Yeah, Henry says some weird things, but no, the toothache thing, that's a thing. Is it? It is. I'm not even going to Google it. Like it. A, you miss it like a toothache. Yeah, I miss you like a toothache. I think that means I don't miss that it. Yeah, I don't miss and it I don't all. miss the snow. That's what I'm trying to get at. But you still kind of miss too. <laughs> no, I don't miss snow. Snow's stupid. It's wet. It's rain that's cold. Oh, it's fun, man. You can build snowmen. Yeah, yeah, and then your clothes get you wet. You your girlfriend cold. in the I built face. built an igloo with my fights. kid one time. That was fun. You can go skiing. Did you live in an igloo when you lived in Alaska? Of course. Everyone lives in an igloo. Yeah, I figure. is up there. But you can't put the heater on, right? Because so the house will melt. That's the best construction to be in. Yeah. During the winter, he's building igloos. <laughs> summer, they melt. Winter, boom. But yeah, you got it boom. every year. So you're here for the summer and then go yeah. back to work. In the yeah. To yeah, make igloos. Well, you missed our theory that me and Paul came up with about Chuck over here. Chuck. Chuck. Okay. So I, we think he's a serial killer from Alaska. Escaping. Got a new identity, sold everything, and moved literally to the world, the farthest part of America. How long did you drive around? Dropping you? bodies oh, and evidence. The cops were looking for me. I, I talked with Brandon. He's going to blur out my face, change my voice. Yeah, yeah. That way the, the FBI doesn't catch on to me. Here, but, uh, Making the murderer. Yeah. yeah so. Chuck over here. No one that didn't deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> they had it coming, I swear. Yep. No, never been arrested. So let's... let's smooth criminal. Never got caught. Here's That's a... Right. Uh, you know, anyone anyone who's been on the show or anyone who's hung out with me knows I'm a conspiracy nut. So what what's uh let's let's uh take Tom down the conspiracy road. Which chemtrails. <laughs> what do you know about it? No. I don't even know that term. You don't know chemtrails? Mm -mm. That airplanes are spreading chemicals. Those oh chemical actually they've trails. admitted I mean, environmental they, like, control. They, they oh. have admitted that, that, that they are. Like spreading stupid dust all over the <laughs> United <laughs> States. It's citizens. just a matter of people thinking that, you know, it's an attack on us, you know, like like they do put stuff in the air. There are there are 
you know, that term can be an official term, chemtrails, but like there's people saying that it's, they don't know what it is and it's there to, as an attack on humanity, right? But there are some pretty wild videos. Like I've watched, so chemtrails has been the one conspiracy that never interested me. Like I'll be honest, it, it, I never, I never <clears throat> had a lot of interest in it, but I watched a couple videos the other day just for giggles. I'm like, maybe, maybe there's something there. Let me look at it. And these guys, um, <clears throat> They'll, they'll watch these planes, like they'll have like really high power cameras, like the P900 right now is like, it's like the, the shit. It's like, you got like, I don't know, the 63X zoom and then another 83X digital. It's like, so this is the camera to have. But the guys watching planes and they go across the sky and then they just disappear. Like the plane will just like, it's gone. It's like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, the, like it didn't go out of sight, it just like turned off, right? And then like you'll watch the trails behind it and they won't match up with the engines, right? And I'm, like, I've, I've seen this, I've seen the videos, and like, the, the speculation is that the plane is a holograph and somehow that the, the trails are being like, created somehow, some, some, it's weird. I mean, like, honestly, it is, it is pretty fascinating. I'm not, I'm not, I haven't gone down that road yet, but, uh, <laughs> but, the, but the, the videos are pretty interesting when you watch them, like. Um, Watched a couple. Another thing is they know. stay in the sky too long. Like, yeah. uh, like they'll say that you'll see like four other planes go by while this one's like going super slow. It'll just be there for a long time going. So they, but uh, I'm not, I'm not really up on it. But again, I watched a few just for giggles to see what it was about. But back to coach's question, Bobby's question. What, what conspiracies are, are you into? Um, you, you know, I, uh, if any, don't believe our governments, you know, I'm, I don't, really believe anything I hear so I'm, I'm really I think our government's uh, super full of shit and I think uh, you know like I'm real into the cryptocurrencies and the blockchain for that reason just you know it's my hedge against the yep. the banks and you know I, I, I believe 90% of we're just being fed bullshit yep. um, <clears throat> I, I don't know it's like some of like the major like the flat earth stuff not not me you know which uh, I, I do have to point out one thing, though, about that after watching last week's podcast. So uh, when you fly to Europe from Alaska, six months out of the year, you fly over the North Pole, and the other six months, you have to go to New York and go around. Uh, I don't know if it's too cold or if there's just not enough people buying the flights or whatever. But So I actually know someone that's done both. He flew over the North Pole to Europe and then flew back through New York. So he's kind of... <clears throat> Flown around the world, you know, like at least the northern hemisphere. Yeah. So, but that works on a flat plane. Yeah, right? yeah, that works say. on a flat plane. Well, he didn't plane. say anything about like you know flying over a cliff and going inverted. Or well, no, that would happen. No, not <laughs> in the South <laughs> Pole. It's the South Pole that you can't go over. Yeah, it's the South Pole. Oh, yeah. I got you. The whole thing is just flat. So the North North Pole's pole in the middle of the dish. The North oh, Pole's okay. in the middle. Yeah. Uh, you, you may have me sold then. Yeah. We can talk. We we can talk about that. I love talking about. I, I'm, every episode, I'm more educated. I watch. Brennan's like, why well, you got to bring that up? Hours hours I'm like, well, hours. no. I think I know someone that kind of flew around the world. It seemed like so. It made sense to me. I thought I should. Bobby it loves it. And that's all I want to talk yeah. about. You know, I, and I get it. I get it. And I, I don't question everything. Really no, I love that. I know. I know it gets everything. repetitious. I'm just saying that. Um, it's true. I'm sorry. It's true. <laughs> the earth is full. Well, let, let's I don't mind if you disagree. I, like, I, I, I don't mind. Some, yeah, who was I don't I think mind if fall. you disagree. I don't care if how you label well, me. Jason it doesn't believe it at all. No, Jason. He, he, that fucker. <laughs> that at fuck, all. Look, he knows. So he messaged me last night and he goes, you can't, you're blocked on Facebook. I'm blocked for 30 days. You can't even like a fucking post. You can't like a post. You can't reply to someone. I can't even message someone. Can you see what we tag you in? I, that's all I can do. So Jason go, messaged me. He goes, Hey man, what's up? And he's like, "Oh, that's right, you're blocked, aren't you?" And I was like, "I can't say anything." And he's like, "The Earth's a sphere, bitch." I'm like, Motherfucker, I can't respond. You're, you, oh, you. God. Well, back to the government thing. I'm like, what do you think of the whole like the these IEDs, explosive devices, being mailed to mailed to Democrats? Right before this big election coming up. I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I haven't looked too much into it, but it the whole thing seems sketchy. Our, our, our government, to me, is is. Uh, it, it's divide and conquer. I, I, I am 100% positive the Democrats and Republicans are in it together. I mean, they're, they're in bed together. This whole thing is smoke and mirrors to yep. political you know, theater. Yeah, you know, you, you hate the most strongest emotion, right? So 
they've got this shiny little thing atta- you know, attracting everyone's attention in the corner of the room while they rob you blind. Yeah. And you know, since everyone's too busy hating the other party, they don't hold their party accountable, Account. right? Yeah. They, they lie to you, they cheat, they rip you off. It's, it's, it's just absolute corruption, and, and any Democrat or Republican is going to say the same thing. Well, at least they're not those goddamn Republicans, right. or they're not those liberals, yeah. you know. And it's like, no, no, they're lying to you. They're cheating. They're stealing. They're crooks. They're, they're, yeah. you know, how, how can you defend them I, or support them just because they're that lesser of I two think our government doesn't kill here it kills me. And and there's power up to here, right? And our government is first off, our presidents are chosen by the Bilderberg Group. Like they're 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 picked out. They're put in power. They're marketed to the people and they're marketing both sides. It doesn't matter. Just like they finance both sides of a war. And those people, I think that they only uh, select and market people that they've got like crazy dirt on, like like pedophilia stuff. And then even if they don't, it's like someone should come to any kind of power. They just entice them with drugs and, you know, they they they, they get some dirt on them. They right? keep them in check. And they keep them in check and they just they do what they want to do. And that's uh, we're just. Um, they create wars, and I mean, look, yeah. it's all about making money. The wars are all about yeah. money. We could we could have ended world hunger. We could have never had world hunger. It could have been oh, ended yeah. from the beginning, right? But instead, we've got all these black budgets and uh, all these homeless vets and homeless people all around the world uh, that we're not dealing with. But yeah, you give one point six billion dollars to a lottery winner. <laughs> a lottery yeah. winner, right? Yeah. Well, you know, and back to the whole bomb thing. I think it's funny. I think like what 20, 30 years ago. This would have worked. Like, I really think this was like, I'm not saying it was a Democrat. I'm just saying it was probably a Democrat trying to, like, make themselves the victim. And this probably would have worked 20, 30 years ago. But because of social media, because, like, they're so quick. Even CNN messed up, like, sending packages, like, well, excuse me, photos of the packages they received. You know, the stamps weren't marked. You know, if you find a bomb, the first thing you're going to do is unwrap it and take a photo of it. Like, it doesn't make sense. And having people really dig into what looks like a conspiracy and start like poking holes in it. And then it didn't last, what, like two days before everybody realized, well, this whole thing is full of shit. Like, it doesn't make any sense. The bombs look like cartoon bombs, you know, like I had people would make in Hollywood. You know, I worked as a dog handler. I know what IEDs look like, and they look like anything. They could be anything. But you wouldn't have a black wire and a red wire. Like, why would you buy two different wires? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And everything would be internal. Like, it would be inside the pipe bomb. And you wouldn't have a big-ass clock like what that doesn't even make any sense they just wanted people to know that when they opened it or saw it oh my god this is a bomb but thanks to social media and photos and people talking about and having experts immediately like no this is bs it's harder for the government to lie and that's why i think nasa doesn't go to space anymore to the moon because it's harder hold on hold on to make lies you thought you think we went to the moon? No, no, no. Well, they don't attempt or they don't pretend to go anymore. Oh, okay. Because like, like, well, everybody believes we went to the moon because they saw it on the I'm, radio. I'm giving you five more IQ points, just Thank so you know. I'm adding that. <laughs> yes. Adding. They, they, they believe. But I read this somewhere. We like what the '60s, early '70s. People believe we went to the moon because they saw it on the radio. You know what I'm saying? There was some guy on the radio just like... Or the worlds, right? Wasn't that like some kind of radio? Yeah, thing? people yeah, thought it was people real. Were freaking out. Aliens are evading, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's just some dude reading... Social media is a good thing. It like, it gives everybody a voice and lets everybody talk. I don't have a voice. Well, I'm voiceless right now. Well, it's not a constitutional right. So you have to behave on Facebook. I turned to LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> like, Yo, motherfucker, what's up? Let's get crunk in here. <laughs> I'm not getting any traction on LinkedIn. Oh, Nobody, <laughs> nobody's on LinkedIn. <laughs> I'm desperate. I'm out on LinkedIn going, yo. Well, letter. you said you have a lot more free time on your hands now, don't you? I do. So what have you been doing with that free time? More conspiracy Solving? shit. More conspiracy shit. I've been doing, I've been, you know, I got, I got more work. I got like nine years worth of work to do in my school, you know, so I'm all, I've got like endless projects. I try to balance it out. Um, but then, then just, you know, more conspiracy videos. I, I enjoy it. Like, that's the thing. I, you know, I enjoy looking at the one thing, one thing that, one thing about history is that, you know, and everyone's heard it before, is that history is written by the winners. Of course. And it's, it's amazing because if you go out and search, you can find the history written by the losers. You can find that shit, right? It's out, <laughs> at, it's out there. And that's some interesting shit, you know, like, like what really happened. Um, which like what, what the road I'm going down right now is a dark one. I'm not going to go down it, but uh, but uh, you know, flat Earth took me there. You know, 
Flat Earth took me there. I was so watching... it looks like a frisbee. Uh, yes. Oh yeah. No. Uh, no, no, a, no, no, no it could be a plate no. with a plate. with the the North Pole in the middle, the po- the <laughs> continent surrounding it, and the edge of the plate. Well, I mean, it, nobody knows what different. it could look like. Like yeah, it, could, yeah. it could be an endless plane we it's could true. be on, just an endless plane, just like there's endless space. Like pe- just like people will accept. Oh, well, a gas could be endless. Well, so could a solid be endless. We could yeah. be on an endless plane. We really don't know. The only thing, the only thing we know is we can't circ- circumnavigate the, the globe or the, the earth north to south or vice versa. And the only thing I know is that we haven't been to space. And why, why haven't we? And why are we putting out propaganda videos like we're in space? You know, why, why do we do that? Um, you know, there's, there's so much. And why, why when, you know, if you look at what's called empirical evidence or, you know, evidence that you can do, right, uh, repeatable science that you can do, if I measure a body of water, it's flat. If I measure seven miles of water, it's flat. If you hire professionals that do this for a living, like this was done in, in Brazil, they went out there and measured angles of buildings and all kinds of crazy shit. And I mean, just like with, with um, like the, hot, the most expensive equipment you can use, you know? And <clears throat> they can't detect any curve whatsoever. There's no, Kansas is flatter than a pancake, literally. Like when I say, I, I mean, quite literally, it's basically like 99.999% flat. It's basically a ruler. Um, the earth is, the, as far as we can measure, it's flat everywhere. And then when you, when you fly a plane over the earth, which you should be dipping down like 31 miles something ridiculous every 500 miles. That's like a ridiculous amount of dip. You should be going like nosing down. They don't. Pilots don't. Hmm. They'll fly, they'll fly 2,000 miles keeping the gyroscope level as can be. That gyroscope should have been going like this the whole time and you should have been correcting it to make it level because a gyroscope does not correct with gravity. Like some people go, I got in an argument on Facebook with a dude goes, well, with gravity it levels. No, it does not. It, you, you can, I've seen videos where people have spun gyroscopes at an angle and then left it there for an hour. It's no different in a room than it is in a plane. The gyroscope behaves no differently. Just because you put it on a plane, gravity didn't affect it differently. It doesn't right itself. Gyroscopes have uh, adhere to a principle called rigidity in space, and and that's what honestly gyroscopes are what we use, or what they claim to use in the space shuttle for navigation. Like that's how, basically, all the direction of a of a of a space shuttle. Because I was sitting there watching the old Apollo Eleven computers, like what what, what the, which is hilarious. I mean, you want to talk about some hilarious hilarious ass shit? But I was like, how do they navigate in space, right? And they use a gyroscope because the gyroscope. Uh, they base it all off the rigidity of so once it exits the atmosphere of Earth, all the navigation is done on the basis of two things like star triangulation and um, the rigidity of this you know the angle of this gyroscope. So those two things are, and th- that's how they explain it, right? Like yeah. science can explain anything. Like, that's the amazing part, right? But I like how it supports the principle that that gyroscope never loses its angle, right? Whatever it was that. That what it, what it, when you spun it up, it's going to be rigid in space. And as long as you keep you maintain a high speed of spin, that inertia and that, uh, that will, will, will keep that object at whatever angle you have it fixed at. So what, what would be the point of, of keeping this lie going? Because obviously this is something that would cost millions of dollars. I've got an answer dollars. for that. Like every satellite no, it wouldn't image cost, would have to be Hold on, fake. hold on, hold on. It wouldn't cost millions of dollars. It would make bodies billions and billions of dollars of profit. So for example, something you just brought up. Last year, the international space budget, so the budget of ESA and NASA and all the other space programs was $302 billion, billion, with a B. Wow. That was the budget. <clears throat> NASA gets $52 million a day. It's either 52 or 55, it's 50 something. Jeez. Do you know how much CGI you can crank out for $52 million yeah. a day? Especially if you don't have anything real. It's a money-making machine. What's CTI? CGI. CGI, CGI yeah. Images. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So now, if you, if you ask you me the why, on me real quick. The, the why is very simple. <clears throat> if, if you say that we're, we're an accidental speck in space that happened because of it's, you know, this, this big bangs, which are happening all over the place over trillions and trillions of years, and we just happen to be the... The, the spark of carbon that turned into life, and 
people are going to behave a lot differently. Yeah, some dude will go out and kill your mother for a gold ring or whatever. You know, there'll be murder and there'll be violence and there'll be because there's no repercussions. We're just you're a blip. You're off this earth. Live it like a rock star because you're here and you're gone. Yolo. Then then you find out the earth is flat. And then you read about you read about you read in the Bible and you read in the Book of Enoch that your religion said, hey, the earth is flat. And then you're like, oh shit, wait a minute. Maybe I need to turn to religion. I, I think people would be more religious. I think everyone would be religious. If, if they came out and knew, believed that the earth were flat, you'd be stupid not to be religious. You'd, you, you would. Like, let's say, let's say tomorrow the governments came out and said, hey, we can't hide it any longer. You, we live on a flat plane. And we, we, haven't, we can't get past the South Pole, you know, what people think is the South Pole, Antarctica. We can't get past. There's like a, there's like a fucking dome. It's, we don't know how to blast through it, right? Um, we, we tried to tunnel under it. We tried everything. Let's say that happened. That matches everything in the Bible. Would you become religious at that point in time? Like if you, fuck, you know, we have a flat earth and we're under a dome. That's it, in the Bible. Would it make me believe there's some mythical guy that lives in the clouds? No, I don't think so. Okay, so so how would you? <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. About it. Okay, but how would you rectify a, in your brain a three thousand mile high dome that is, I don't know, twenty five thousand miles across and three thousand miles high? There, there's no mythical creature that could build this. There's no. What are you going to have a team of contractors that are have eight arms or what, like? Wh- I, Nothing I but a God could build that. Nothing like honestly, whatever he is, it, it, it actually might make me think we live in the Matrix. Which might be my <clears throat> I, yeah. I'd be close to believing that shit. Yeah, I know. Well, right? but hold on. No, I, I, I do. I do get where you're going with it, though. Yeah, something, something that massive, something that you know, hard to explain. You know, you would you would have to you would Even, have to start looking at, at a, 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 some type of God or a creator. A creator, exactly. Yeah, you'd have to look at a creator, and even if you were in a matrix, in that in that in that respect, he's your he's your god, the dude that created you, right? The AI, uh, yeah, the The AI, whatever, whatever it is, or he, whatever, whatever it is, if he could create you, right? And you know, it talks. The cool thing is, um, yeah, I I go back to the Book of Enoch. I I just think it's amazing. You know, like like Enoch. I became fascinated with this book once. Once I once I came to believe that the Earth was flat, I became fascinated with the Book of Enoch, which I've listened to. I'm still stuck on my fifth listen right now, but I've listened to it four times in its entirety. And uh, Enoch walked with God for 300 years, and he he talks about all the all the knowledge that God and the angels shared with him. And it's amazing because this book was part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it's got some science in it that's insane. Like when you listen to it, you're like, holy shit, that's dead accurate. That t- when he talks about the timing of all the stars and the sun and the moons, the paths they take and how m- exactly how many, like, you know, it even explains like leap year and shit, like things that were, um, it's just, it's, it's got some um, super technical stuff in there that's hard to grasp. So. That's cool. I'm just not there yet. I'm more on... Um... I'm still a slave to mortgage payments and paying, <laughs> well, and you, paying the bills on the first of the month. And that's what that's coming to jujitsu. Yeah. Well, you haven't come to jujitsu for a while. Let's not bring that up. That's yeah. all. That's, yeah, that's all. It's, yeah. Whether it's Friday, days. winter Saturday. Yeah, hey, I had to go support the kids, man. I had a birthday party. Mm-hmm. Had oh, you didn't show up Friday either? No. I couldn't come Friday. I had to go to my kids' school. Saturday was Saturday. great. Sounds um, like a coach let me win, shift. and it was so obvious. Yeah. And I was mad. Did you get a stripe? No. No. Okay. No. It doesn't matter. Though. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Oh, if it gives me a, if it gives me a purple ball, I'm still going to be as good as I am now, or as bad as I am now. Doesn't matter. We kinda but go. coach let me win, and it was very obvious. I don't know. I think you got nah. it personally. It felt like honestly, I'll like I'll be totally honest. Totally, totally honest. It was a really nice setup. It was so good. I was like, yeah, this is the one I'm giving up. It was like it would have been hard to fight out of. It would. It was. It legitimately would have been hard to fight out. Jason, of. I'm not that saying one. I couldn't have got out of it. You I'm just saying. Could. What was it? What's the mission get? He was in the back. I was. We're doing this new thing. We you you wouldn't know if you were there, but we're doing this new thing, <laughs> where it was ten minutes Stabby each. Rip. So we would fight ten minutes, and then we'd fight again. Switch offense and defense, and he would let me start from any position I wanted. So I started from the back, then S mount, and then back. So on the third back. Um, instead of trying to do like the whole lock in the arm because it wasn't working, I kind of was setting up a Kimura on one side, and then I kind of just leaned over to the side and I pushed his face away and threw my leg over to get him an arm bar. 
and it just felt too easy. It felt like I pushed my daughter over. So, so the rule is everyone has to lose. You're not done. Like everyone, everyone must lose. lose. Is this a new school? Yeah, ten minutes you have to lose, then ten minutes the days. other party has to lose at least once, right? Okay. And you let so, me win. So that rule was kind of kind of weird that when you told everyone they had to lose, because uh, so I was going against Jeff, who's a blue belt, and and I got him with the choke, right? I got I got tapped. First time I've ever tapped a blue belt in my life. Although it didn't quite feel right because if the point is that he has to lose and he has to tap, I mean, I went through submission after submission after submission, and finally it was like, and I don't know, I'd have to ask him, but I kind of felt like he was like, Give okay, well, I have to tap at some point, and this one's pretty good, so let me give this one to him. So I, I kind of felt a little robbed of, yeah. of, of tapping it's a blue like a belt for the first time. trophy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that, but, that, that felt a little weird. So what it's trying to do is foster um, – if you uh, if you listen to a lot of great grapplers out there, listen to Henzo's guys talk about it. Listen to uh, I don't remember specifically which ones, whether it was Gordon Ryan or whether it was Gary Tonin or it was one of them, and they're talking. But they're not the only ones. Like he and Henner talk about this too. Keep it playful. And I and I'm guilty of warring. I'm guilty as well. But they talk about you learn more and faster if you if you will play with your opponent and give up submissions. In other words, this. This war of attrition that we have, it's a, it's a very slow, there may be fast moments, but for the, fo- for the most part, there's a very slow game. Someone, you, you, someone gets on your back, you spend five or ten minutes fighting, you don't want to give up this one submission, you, you eke your way out, and that's good, that's good to do sometimes too. It's good to have those battles, those wars. But you could have, in that time, went through ten other transitions, and ten other, and you could have taken that submission and moved on, and he could have, and basically... The thought, the theory is, the thought process is that you learn more, and he and Henner, again, they're big on this, as is Henzo School, as is a lot of really good grapplers believe that if you just keep it playful and you allow the other person to move around, experiment and try out their stuff, that you, you learn more, right? So I had started speaking about this a few weeks ago. I said, look, everyone needs to tap. Everyone needs to tap once a roll, right? Give, don't let them know which one it is. Give it up. We also want to get rid of this ego thing. You want to... Yeah. Now... I, I'm guilty of worrying as the, as the next person. I want to prove to myself when this 250-pound dude comes in that I can that I can beat him, you know, 10 out of 10 times, whatever. I'm, I'm guilty of it. But the truth is when we're learning, and I think that's a good tool. That, that's a good tool to use some, sometimes. But there's other tools that you can add in that, that help just as much, if not more. And one of those is playful rolling and giving it up. And that's, that's – because a couple weeks ago when I talked about uh, – yeah. I know a lot of people didn't tap, including myself. Like, I know, like, I was like, you know, when, when it came down to it and I started rolling, I, my ego got in the way and it's like, man, I don't want to tap. I'm like, what the heck? So, I didn't either. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, I got a blue belt on my back. I'm not, <laughs> I want to see how good my defense is. So, I think it was a good thing to employ this rule, at least to test it out. Um, it was a new idea for me where everyone has to tap once in this role. You have to, right? I so, think, see, I think I get what you're saying. But I think that's more of a rule that you should apply to your higher belts. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't need to motivate Jason. Like, oh, well, I tapped for Jason, so Jason's like, you know, he wants to come back. No, I think, like, for white, like, let, I get what you're saying. I totally get it. I understand. I just, for us to let, like, what, I let Jeff win? No, like, I want to, yeah. Jeff's going to beat me mm, interesting. higher percentage of the time. That's a good point, too. Yeah, yeah. and that, that was the thing, like, uh, you know, like and I right said, now I got a white belt, a heavy. Jeff, a blue belt on my back the whole time. So I'm like, yeah. well, this guy's tapped me so many times already. I don't, he doesn't he, need I don't, that. Yeah, so he doesn't need the attaboy. It, it better, better for me and him for me to fight the submission the best I can, you know, because then it's working on my defense and his offense. Because, But I, I do get it, like, with a, you know, and roles are reversed, you know, for, you know, the higher belts. I don't know, man. I mean, I, I feel like there's some blue belts out there that, get really sketched out when a white belt gets close to tapping them and their egos even more like they don't want to go home but henry does like they don't want to go but her and but hurt because i notice when i get close like, like, like the queso henry the cheese uh, cheese. Uh, the cheese that's what i call it <laughs> the queso henry like fights i'm like bro i'm gonna break your arm and he gets out of it but like he'll risk the arm being broken henry's yeah. he'll yeah. just he'll, man yeah and that's my biggest fear is like right now I don't want to get injured to where I'm out. For but you know what's yeah. what I, I miss from like when I first started that like so the thing I did like about Henry's classes on Tuesdays is we didn't drill but we did almost like stations and I think that would hit more what you want you know like have 
you know, one person is defending guard while the only, only person, all he's doing is trying to pass guard. And then, like, we would just rotate to the right. And then somebody was, like, side mount. You're only escaping side mount. And the other guy's only trying to hold side mount. Yeah. So those were good because there were drills. Yeah. And there really wasn't worrying about any submissions there. And then you can work things out. But when you're rolling and open, at least for me, I, like, it's not a it's not an ego thing for me. It's just, like, I, I, I like measuring myself, testing myself. And like, how do I do that? By rolling with other people to see where I'm at. So yeah, well, and and again, that's like what we did uh, wasn't something we'll do every class. It's yeah, something yeah. that would just use as a tool once in a while, and maybe we change it so that only the higher belt needs to tap, right? Because the lower belt's done plenty of tapping. But but I want to make sure that I want to foster this um, this mentality that that we try to get rid of the ego of tapping. That we we need to everyone does need to tap. I believe that, right? I believe that will make you better. And if you again, if you listen to the greats and the way they train, they do have this. Maybe maybe it's not all the time, but it should be a large portion of the time where you're just playing, where you're being allowed to work these positions that you would normally never get to. You're you're, I mean, as a white belt, you're rarely going to get to practice you know, the, the submissions you're learning on me, you know, like yeah. foot locks, mm-hmm. whatever, you know, but we should be allowing that yeah. exchange in both directions. Right. So you are practicing, you are learning. Yeah. But cause, I'm, Oh, sorry to interrupt, but no. yeah, you, you gotta, you gotta do both. You know, sometimes when you roll with the higher belts, I, I rolled with uh, Brent earlier this week. Really good. We had a great roll. It was really fun. I think we went for like 10 or 12 minutes before he tapped me. Uh, but I never had a single submission attempt. You know what I mean? It was yeah. just me fighting for my life, defending one submission after the next, after the next, after the next, which is also good. But then again, you know, it, you also need to practice your offense. But it, that, that was a good class. It was, it was a very good exercise. It's, uh, the, the other day we, we were sparring, and I've been struggling with side control. So I'm like, start in side control. You know what I mean? I need, I need the practice, and I don't think I ever got out of well, it. And he's good in <laughs> like but, but, you know, I'm too. just like, he's like, why you let me start in side control? And yeah. I'm like, well, just because I need the work here, you know. it's I've, You've been teaching it, and and against smaller people, I can get out of it. But but then it's, it's like, all right, yeah, I want you in side control. If I, if I can get out of this, then it's, I'm definitely well, getting somewhere, you know. And I've never had back control on you before, ever. And then I, but you giving me back control. Man, that was so different fighting someone like you because, like, me and Jason have been working on that a lot when he's not in the water. But is he? Yeah. So it was different, like you, like, man, like, yeah. when I had someone's back, it's, it's so much easier for me when I had your back. I was like, holy crap, it's different. Like, it's so much different. And then you're on S-mount. And S-mount, I felt comfortable holding you in S-mount, but I was so scared to give up that position. Yeah, like, your S-mount's solid. I was solid trying to fight. You're so heavy. And it's yeah, just like, I don't man, want that dude oh, up, on my, up on my upper chest. Yeah. That's a bad spot. If to he be learned, it, yeah. but you know, I can see he was afraid to go for the submissions. If you had any kind of confidence going for those submissions, geez, man. And if you knew how to switch... God, S mount's devastating. You got a good S mount, man. I'm gonna learn it. Um, details. What I want to say about the the position, like in a submission too. Uh, there, I, there's times where I felt like, man, I'm gonna crank on this guy's arm. And why? He, Ameri- you know, have him in Americana, and he's just not submitting, right? And is it his ego? Like I don't want to break his arm, but no, it was the details. Like I didn't have it in right. I didn't have my hand. Like what I learned later with you was, put your head down. You know, the grip get tighter to the body. And then, that's gonna really. Well, that happened. The, with, you know what I'm saying? That happened with me and Tom. Like so he had me in the Americana, but he had his arm behind my head, and yeah. then he was setting it up. Yeah. Super. Rough. So I, while we were fighting, like I'm gonna tell you what you're doing yeah. wrong right now. Well, I did that to you, but it was a sneak attack. Yeah, but you did it different. You escaped it from my mm-hmm. head, and then you killed it. Because I let you have it because yeah. I knew you were wrong, and then you did something. I was like, oh, crap. I pulled but it over Tom just kept it over under my head. Yeah, I just kept trying to wrench on it. And then he's it like, bro, what, is your shoulder that flexible? Part. I'm like, no, you're doing it wrong, but I'll tell you when we're done rolling. Yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to tell you right now. Yeah. yeah. I've been doing I, I try that on purpose sometimes just because, oh, you're doing it wrong, and then I just. Well, yeah, I'm which right you did to me that one time. I was like, oh, man, nice. Yeah. That's, that's sneaky. I like that. It's a sneaky, but. If, if it's a higher belt, they're not going to fall for it. No. No, I've tried. Yeah, they, they've been there. They just keep their head down. It doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> <clears throat> but it's fun. Well, also, it was a sat- Saturday. You pushed me to roll again. And so I'm definitely – and it, it's the same thing it was when I was doing CrossFit. I'll definitely work out as much as I want to, and then I, I'm done. But that's because I'm lazy. Everyone's lazy. So when you – and I was done for that day because you drained me. You rolled for 20 minutes. But then you're like – Go roll again with Jeff. I'm like, okay, because <laughs> of my militariness. Like, you just told me to do something, I do it. But man, it felt great. Like, 
And I like that, so I want you to keep on pushing me. Yeah, yeah my, my, my style of rolling is, um, and I think we should all have it. You should be able to roll for an hour. Like, honestly, if you ever see me stop, it's not because I'm tired. Like, honestly, like, sometimes I might be like, up, up until, like, this year, it, it was pretty normal of me to roll an hour. That, that's pretty normal. Like, you know, 15 years, I've been doing an hour rolling a day. But now it's more because of injuries. Like, like, it's not because I'm tired. I can roll an hour, no problem. I could probably roll two hours, no problem. And probably at full, you know, full. But, like, right now, um, and that's why I say, you know, like, jujitsu is, it is, it is so, uh, it, it's like a superpower. It is. But if you train every day, and, and our, what gives us these uh, injuries is our ego. It, it is our ego. It's, so my, all is a result of my ego. Uh, except for my lower back, my worst injury. I've got five herniated discs in my spine. I've got a something tore in my shoulder, which I'm going to check out this week. I'm going to go to the doctor. Um, uh, something's going on with my hip. I've either got an infection inside my hip or a bad bruise. So something's going on on my hip, which I don't understand. And then and now my knee feels jacked up, or I can't even – now I can't sit on – both feet evenly like like that so now so this whole my whole left side essentially so my left shoulder is completely jacked up my lower spine my left hip and my left knee so i'm like man you know 10 minutes last night i'm laying in bed and i'm trying to get out of bed it's like it's like a five minute process i gotta get up and like uh, you know once i start moving it, it, it'll loosen up like it will loosen up and when i'm rolling I don't care. I just forget. It's like I can turn off the pain. You know, it's like, okay, I'm, in, I'm on the mats. I can turn it off. And I know in a fight, I could ignore all those pains, right? But r as soon as I stop and as soon as the, you know. Adrenaline endorphins yeah, go down. Yeah, I, I don't want to say that because I don't think I use it anymore. But whatever it is, like as soon as I stop training, all of a sudden the pain starts setting in again, right? So. Uh, <clears throat> Decimal marijuana. Yeah. Something. But uh, I'm going to try to get – this is the year. Like, basically, you know, when I went to the doctor before, the doctor said just ride it, you know, ride it till the wheels fall off because whatever you do, whatever corrective action you take, it's going to deteriorate faster. So, in other words, I went to go get a fusion once before, and the doctor said, listen, the, your L5-S1 is destroyed. It's gone. It's like you're bone on bone now. There's not even a disc there. But he said, if, if we fuse that – you're going to lose 15% of your mobility because the most amount of mobility is in, your, is in your L5S1. He goes, but then you're going to be trying to do the things you were doing. You're not going to see, you're not going to know not to do those things. So you're going to put more stress on the L4, L5. And he said, and that's going to go in a year or two. And then you're going to have, need another fusion. And then, you're, and then it, he says, it's just going to be, a, it's just going to go faster and faster and faster. And each time it's going to be six months of healing. So what I was hoping to get was a pro disc, which in Europe they've been doing for years. And like athletes here that destroy their disc, football players, whatever, they'll, they'll fly over to Europe and pay $35,000, $40,000. Get rid of AIDS and everything. Yeah. But uh, that's a conspiracy is American doctors. They're a joke. Yeah. Gotta yeah. Go Eastern. Big pharmacy. Yeah. Got to go, gotta go Eastern medicine, man. That's one thing I fully believe in. Naturopathic doctors. About Chinese medicine. Yeah. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, man. Acupuncture, rolfing, all that stuff. That stuff works. Our, our, our. I hate our medical industry, man. Yeah. They're, they're a joke. I'm with you on that. Well, yeah. pharmace the pharmaceutical industries, yeah, they're just making you sicker. And they even yeah. say oh, that they like, know it. Chemo, chemo can. Chemo kills you. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. worse than the cancer. Yeah, for, yeah. forget it. I'll take cancer there's, there's over a, chemo. There's a guy out there named Rick Simpson, and uh, he's been curing people with cancer with uh, CBD and cannabis, or THC and CBD. He's been – he's been. it's like a ridiculous cure rate. And all the people that go to him are terminal. They have terminal cancer, right? And they start taking CBD and THC, and a few months later, they're, they're – And their diet probably changes, too. They're, the biggest thing is the THC. You should see it. It looks like oil. Like this guy cooks it up, and it's like, and they, they'll show like these huge tubes of, you know, you're ingesting a lot of it, right? Yeah. But it's proven. Like if you if you were to, again, YouTube's my biggest source of knowledge, and I know there's bad knowledge out there. You got you just got to look at everything you can and try to, you know, decipher. decipher it and research it and dispute it and look at other. But from everything I can discern, CBD and THC kills. Uh, cancer. It, does, it attacks it. They show it on petri dishes. They show different universities, and you can go to those universities and read the studies on their page. You know, uh, a lot of the universities doing studies on it are in the Middle East, actually. It's CBD amazing. oil is awesome. 
It's amazing. So they just legalized pot in Alaska. <clears throat> CBD oil is illegal. Really? You can do drugs it, legally, yeah. but the medical benefits right. from it, you're not allowed right. to because Big Farm doesn't have control over yep. CBD. Because it like, cures what so a much joke. shit. It does. And they, it's, they show people less having, money they'll get out of it. They show people having seizures, right? These guys, they can't even hold a spoon. They're just sitting there shaking, right? They, they're like this all day, every day. And then they take a few drops of CBD, and within like a minute or two, they're normal. Yeah. They're like, yeah. Yeah. this is CBD. Too, yeah. Kids, uh, this Animals. is proven, and CBD has no psychoactive, no psychotropic effects. It's, there's no, it has no mental effect whatsoever, yet it's proved to reduce effects of Crohn's disease. It stops seizures. It kills cancer. It has, it has like 50 different positive. It's like this modern-day snake oil, right? But uh, it has no negative effects that they could ever find anywhere in any study. No one's ever claimed a, ne a negative effect of it, yet pharmacy, you know, Bar, you know, legally, you can't have it, which is hilarious. See, Until they corner the market. I and About three years it. ago, I was going to start, and I thought I was pretty early on it. I bought like $20,000 of the CBD at wholesale. So we're talking about $60,000 of CBD. You're, get, you're buying it like a third. I bought from Elixinol. I bought from Isodiol. Those are the two primary brands I got. Elixinol, Isodiol, there was one other. And um, what I found out was that you couldn't mark, because there were states it was legal in at this time. There, there were mm -hmm. some states it was legal in. But Google has a strict rule. You cannot market CBD on, on Google. No, so no Google ads. Facebook, you can't market CBD. eBay, you can't market CBD. Mm. Amazon, you cannot sell CBD. So the only place you can sell it is on your own website. But you can't market the website. You can't even create an ad to say, hey, I've got CBD, guys. Yeah, I've got you a can, website. Yeah, yeah you, can't, no. you can't do it. So I bought all this CBD not knowing because I was like, it's legal. you got to be able to, you know, I never would have thought that I'd have a problem marketing it, right? No, couldn't market it. So I, I sat on 20K of C. I started giving it away to all my friends. I noticed that though, like on the Quintet and maybe even some of the UFC fights, or they're, they're, they're advertising. Uh, we, uh, yeah, like, I mean, I'm UFC five packs. You see it a lot, right? Like the, the UFC now. is not Google. There's, a, there's, yeah. again, there's this, a there's small this, there's this community. There's this one cabal at the top. I'm not going to say who it is. So I down. have my thoughts, right? But they, there's this agenda that they have, right? And they own everything. They own, they own the scientific community. They own the banks. They own the media. They own the social media. They own. Everything they're there and and they have an agenda and, it, and they decide uh, They decide what you can and can't do right and if they can't um, You know, there's just certain things you're gonna have a hard thing pushed into law Like how are you gonna how are you gonna make CBD illegal and they have successfully in some places and in some places you can't but how, how like how do they justify that here people are dying of alcohol all day every day you can drink all the alcohol you want and then if you're gonna have something like CBD which is a natural product with no negative benefits and that's gonna be illegal like how do how do the American people accept this it's taboo. ignorance it's well, that's taboo. Say, I, I remember seeing like a I think she was a, a congresswoman or a guy I don't remember what it is but saying that Guam had too many people and if they were worried if Guam kept on getting bigger, that the island Hank was going to flip. Tip. Hank, yeah. Hank Johnson was the, this guy's an idiot, man. Holy, this, but this he's is not. A he, he's a politician. You know, he's got degrees. Yeah. He's, people elected him, and people believed it to be true. I or, thought it was a Saturday Night Live skit when yeah. I first watched it. Or like, like windmills. You know, we can't have windmills because we're going to run out of wind. Like, you know, like... Don't wind is a commodity, bro. Wind. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I trade wind, actually. <laughs> I, I've been, right now, I'm, uh, I'm selling on the dip. Right so it's now. easy to it's easy to convince people that <laughs> CBD is bad or, like, anything just by spinning it right. I'm shorting wind. <laughs> I am. You brought up crypto earlier, which is, I had no idea. Like, I, I, I think that there's not many people that are, that are up on crypto. No, but, people but, have no idea. I'm a, a big supporter of it, not because, A, because I come from 25 years of IT and I'm a developer. I get, I, I, I code, I, I can do, you know, I've been in IT basically my whole working life. And um, the benefits are huge. Like yeah. the fact that, that, like, let's look at some of the benefits. Let's talk crypto for a second awesome. since Tom's, Tom's, Tom's up on awesome. crypto. If you want to look at one of the benefits of it, no one can take it from you. That's awesome. No. You, yeah. no one can, the, when you have your money in the bank, if you piss off the wrong people or you get in trouble, they can just, hey, we just took, we just froze your shit and we yeah. just took it. So no one can confiscate your funds. Number two, it's permissionless. In other words, 
If, if you have $10,000 in the bank, every time you go to buy something, you're asking for permission. You're asking a bank for permission to spend your money. And with crypto, you don't have that. With crypto, you're I can spend my bank? money, it's mine. I can transport it anywhere, anywhere in the world. I can take it with me. I can have $10 billion, and I can, if I fly to Europe tomorrow, it's with me, right? It's virtual, so it's wherever I go. And um, it's limited, so it's, um, it's um, you know, whereas, Fiat currency is unlimited. It's just constantly deflated. It's it's uh, it's designed to be inflationary. And um, look at another benefit of it. The benefits are almost endless, right? But but my big thing, which is what Tom touched on, is that it's the big middle finger yeah. to fucking to the to the to the private entities that profit yeah. from the fiat currency, yeah. right? And Suck it. Yep, suck it, buddy. And we're gonna, and they're manipulating it right now. Like I honestly think the problems that oh, we're having right now, it's it all is. manipulation and fear. Like they're spreading fud because they, they control the news, and that's what's that's yep. what's doing it. But I, my big thing is that it, it's it's not corruptible. Yep. it's decentralized. Nobody yep. owns it. There's nobody that can lie to you. There's there's no one that can get paid off. There 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 can't be fraud because it's open source. Yep. Right. Any yep. of us can go yep. onto the blockchain and find out what happened. Find out what's what. You know if. The, the 2008 bank collapse, you know, if the stock market was on the blockchain, it would not have happened because you would be able to go and you would have known that what the stocks you were buying were actually subprime mortgages that were about to go belly up. Yeah. You would have known what you were investing in. You don't have these bankers that can lie to you and your stockbroker saying, oh, buy the stock. It's great. And you didn't even know you were buying debt. That is so fucking illegal. You cannot sell debt. Yeah. You can't do that without yeah. disclosing it. And that's exactly what they did. And the fact that none of them got put in jail. No, they got sorry, bailed getting, out. Getting they, got, fired up. they got rewarded. Maybe it's maybe right? it's the whiskey. They, but they still I still got their bonuses. Oh, and, oh man. You know, and, and you know what? Instead of putting them in jail. Did you ever see the movie? We gave them $17 trillion. Yeah. Oh, the big short. Big short. Great yeah. movie. Great movie. Great. Yeah. And it yeah. makes you understand everything way easier. It does. And then that's why Bitcoin was created. Yeah. You know? I mean that's that's the that's, some of that whiskey there. Sorry. That, that was the kind of the point of it, you know. There's the benefits of it. And I, yeah, I don't know how long it's going to take for it to to do something, but you know, it's long term, it's a game changer. It really is. That 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 technology and and the fact that you know you can control your own funds. I mean, I I, I love it. You know, I really do think it's it's something special. Yeah. It'd be, so it'd be nice to be able to go switch over completely. Though. I I believe. I don't. I don't think we're close to that. Yet. Oh, we're we're nowhere near that. I, but you I, know. I think four to six years, maybe even ten. Yeah. But but it's gonna be the um, it's gonna be the um, this is an extinction level event for banks. Yeah. They're scared. This they is an scared. extinction level. Have you seen, the, have have like you seen the IBM commercials well, about libraries. blockchain technology? Libraries. IBM has no. commercials on TV now about their blockchain technology. You know, they, they partnered with uh, Stellar XLM, mm -hmm. which is, is one of my coins that I really like. And uh, uh, it's yeah, pretty Stellar, cool. Stellar, Stellar, Stellar uh, Ripple split off, uh, split off of Stellar. I don't know if you know that. No, Rip, Rip, Stellar, Stellar uh, split off from Ripple. Split off from Ripple. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but. Yeah, Similar yeah. technology. Yeah, and, and you know I know I know XLM isn't decentralized, but it, it's not, not gotten it's nothing like Ripple. It's it's right. um it's a nonprofit. Yeah. And that's a good team. That's a good team right there. Yeah, you know I'm, in, I mean? I'm so in I, I'm not into Ripple. Uh, I do. Own You're not going to make anything on Ripple. No, it, it, it's. It has a chance with their involvement with the banks of doing well. I, I honestly kind of hate it because it's it's not decentralized. You know, it's it's ran by a guy yeah. that I don't trust. But um, that guy know, was that, the richest man in the world a for, few months for ago. a bit. Yeah, he, for, and, for and a I'm minute. sure he's still insanely oh, rich. We're talking me? one of the top fifty. Yeah. But I, I think in another year or two, he's going to be by far the richest man in the world. Yeah, like, and, and I don't, they've got partnerships with banks, so it, it has, a, as much as I dislike it, it's got a, a chance to go somewhere, so I do own a bit, but uh, I, I like the XLM model a lot better. Yeah, but, um, yeah it's, uh, I, my, it's, my, it's my big one is EOS. I'm in, I'm at Dan really? Larimer, EOS okay. is the, EOS is, well, I don't know if you know, but EOS was created by Dan Larimer. Dan Larimer created... Yeah. BitShares, which is which was a huge success, and he also created Steemit, which was a huge success. Like yeah. those, those are actually the top two uh, blockchains in the world by transaction today. So, what do you think of the FUD about them uh, being uh, controlled, like 95 percent of them being owned by the? I forget who it is. The, the it's a 
Japanese company that kind of goes in, buys things up, sells it off. They, they just go in and liquidate different markets, housing, real estate, you, you name it. They Supposedly, there's, they own like 95% or more of EOS. So I've always been a little skeptical of EOS. I've made a lot of money on trading it because it went parabolic for a couple of months. It was awesome. Yeah. But uh, I, I've, I've just been leery of it. I've, no, it's I, one of those coins that like it's not a long-term hold. It's something that I just I'm constantly creeping my stop losses up on because I just I'm unsure. But I don't never know what. I'm to in, do I'm, in EOS the news, so. I'm in EOS long. I'm in EOS long. I'm in Ethereum Classic long. I'm in Ethereum long. I'm in yep. obviously Bitcoin long, and I have I uh, hold about somewhere between sixty and seven coins that I've done a good amount of. Yep. Uh, you know, I've read all the white papers, and, and I believe in those. you got to read the white papers. And you got to research the development team, and you got to dig deep because yep. you never know. There's a lot of scams out there for sure. But, uh, yeah, I've got, I've got quite a few that I like a lot. You got, uh, let me tell you, here, here's the thing. Cryptocurrency, first off, like, you're trying to change the world. Like, believing in it is, it, it's your way of fighting. It, it's twofold. It's A, it's the superior technology. It, it is it is the new way of cryptocurrency. It is it's independent. It's separated from the government. The government has control over it. They have no benefit of it. They hate it. They hate it. And it's your way of saying fuck you to the government, right? Or not? I, I don't want to say the government. I mean, uh, it, it, to the to the cabal, to the powers that are yeah. manipulating our government. Yeah, because because you know the people that have the money control our government. Our government's right. a joke. It's yeah. it's, a, it's, it's a just ghost. a facade. Yeah. It's just something that it's controlled by people that have the power and power is money. Right. But you're so. saying in, in our banking system now, right, if I got into trouble, someone could come out there and just deplete my whole checking and savings account. No, they right. freeze your account. Right. Right. Hold on, hold on, wait. You know in, in Greece, when Greece uh, belly up. went belly up, that all the Greece, whatever the Grecians, all of their bank accounts were seized, right? If you had a quarter million dollars in the bank, it was just taken. Just, yeah. just, they just took it. No it's problem. Happened, you you think your, your money is safe in the bank? It ain't safe in the bank. The government can confiscate it at any time. And they in, do, especially when and you're they indicted do. And they make trouble, too much money on Or even if they, they go in debt. If we, yeah. Here's one thing that I noticed uh, in our travels this summer, right? We, we traveled all over through Canada, all over North America, from one end of this continent to the other, right? There's the same theme that I noticed that really just kind of stuck out to me the entire time. Every single city we went into, Jacksonville, any city you want to go to, what are the biggest buildings, the nicest buildings in that Bank city? Bank buildings. buildings. Every yeah. single one yeah. of them. Every yeah. single one of them. All these big, crazy, beautiful buildings well, you, you, in every I mean, single city or banks. And it's like, how much money do you need? How, like, how, how much, why, how can you be making this amount of money to just hold, hold our, my money? Hold my money. Yeah. Right? That's all they're doing. That's yeah. all they're doing is holding your money. And, and yet they're, they're the richest, most powerful people in the world. So well, you what know, gives here? You, you know what I mean? Are you are you familiar with how the fractional reserve banking system works? That they can create money out of thin air, ten percent of every. So the way the fractional reserve banking system works is that every dollar that get, so they're allowed to give loans on the, the money that's in the bank, they're allowed to loan out, but every dollar that's paid back, they're allowed to invent ten percent that they own. So if you like, let's say you're J P Morgan, and this year. Uh, total payments uh, on loans was, I don't know, $100 million. It's way in excess of that. Let's just say it's $100 million for easy math. They can just invent $10 million. And it's theirs. It's their money. It's theirs. That's the fractional reserve banking system. So that would be illegal in any other – and there's no way that would be illegal. But that's what happens when you have a private entity – running the Federal Reserve System, right? They're going to invent laws that work for them to make them oh, richer. They just... Why wouldn't they? Uh, I think... Uh, uh, what, was the, what was the president's name? Andrew Jackson on his deathbed. Andrew Jackson killed the central bank when, when he was in power. He, he abolished it. And um, on his deathbed, uh, this is supposedly how history is written. When they asked him what his greatest accomplishment was, he said ending the, the central bank. And then Didn't right after Kennedy he died, do something like that? But Kennedy had a, a, a law enacted. He was, he was he going to end the he Federal Reserve. To, then he got and killed. Then he got whacked. And then the first act they, of, I think it was... Who, that was not a conspiracy. Who, who, was, who, took, who right. was the vice president that took office after him? It was... Nixon? The, ter, whoever it was, I can't remember now. But whoever it was, the, the vice president, the first act was to reverse was to reverse that act that Kennedy had done. Because he didn't want to get shot. 
<laughs> Lyndon B. Johnson. <laughs> Lyndon B. Johnson. Lyndon B. Johnson. I think that's right. Yeah. You're a fact checker. Yeah, he's doing. You're doing a good job. Thanks, man. Great job. Thank you're you. a fag checker. Fag checker. Fags, yes. <laughs> Cigarettes. What? I don't think the audience knows none of us are wearing pants. We're not. Wait, why did you say anything? I, oh, it just I, makes I, everything well, flow more I naturally. Keep that you know? on the... Well, I mean, obviously. It... Oh, that's cool. Sorry. Some secrets we keep to ourselves. First can, we, can we edit that, Brendan? Can yeah. we get that out of here? We can edit that. Okay, sorry. Did you hear what Jason's trying to do? In April? Yes, he's trying to bring Gordon Ryan. Did you know that? Jackson. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah I guess you're we're not as close. Um, you, oh, he didn't talk to you? Gordon? Oh, he asked No, Gordon. Yeah, no, he didn't tell me about that. No, because oh, you guys are boys. I saw the photo of you guys. <laughs> we, we had one, uh, what would you call that? A moment. Private. Together? Private session? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be exciting, having Mr. That would Gordon be Ryan here. That would be dope. I'd definitely come to class that day. Nice. It's a little pricey, though. Yeah. But we can, I think we do it. I want them. It'd be cool. It'd be exciting. Good for the school, too, I think. Yeah, I, I don't think we'd be having it here. It'd be too big. That's what, that's what we were talking about. Having it somewhere else. But that's, J Jason likes bringing in these high-level guys. And uh, for some people, it's good. For some people, it's not. I think if you're like a – I don't know how much it's going to be benefit you if, if you're a white belt because uh, – and I'm not taking anything away. I'm, not, I'm just I'm speaking my, my honest mind. Like – I think you have to have the math. You have to have the fundamentals mastered, it, it, even the fundamentals of what they're teaching, right? For it to have a benefit to you, yeah. like like when Craig Jones came in, over what, my head, what, what he was showing oh was God. hard for me, you know. And I'm I've been I've been doing the honey hole since, and I had expanded on the honey hole. I I tripled it, you know, like it, from what I originally saw Andre Galval teaching it in his series. I, I had like ten attacks from honey hole, and what Craig was showing was you know, details that, it, don't get me wrong, like I took a lot of those details with me, but it was high level. Like if you didn't, you needed to know the fundamentals of that first, you know, like it wasn't gonna benefit you, like, uh, and I, that's, go, go by all means, go. You'll, I'm sure you'll learn something, you'll take something away He's from got it. A but, photo but it's of way more <laughs> beneficial if you already know the fundamentals yeah. of that system, let's put it that way. No, oh, when, when Craig came here, like I said, it was like my second or third month in jiu-jitsu, and he was showing stuff that I didn't even know existed. I, I was like, what? I did, a, I did a Hicks and Gracie seminar, and uh, this was a couple of years ago, maybe two or three years ago, two, probably two, and it was the most fundamental seminar I ever took. Like, we were doing fucking trap and roll. <laughs> and everything he was going to show, you get pissed off at first. You're like, are you fucking kidding me? I'm a black belt, dude. You're going to show, we're going to do fucking track. And then sure enough, he shows you some shit you did not know. And you're like, oh, shit. It's like, no one showed me that. Like, Hickson figured out all this shit. These little tiny details. Like, just one more tiny detail to make it more effective. And that's the real benefit. Like, I probably, my jiu-jitsu probably overall grew more from his seminar than any other seminar, you know, and, and I, you know, um, the fundamentals, you know, fundamentals are, are, are that way. Um, I, I remember I got to train with, um, Marcelo Garcia, uh, Todd Williams, uh, lined up bringing Marcelo to my school in 2006 and he spent three days in Jacksonville. We got to train with him. We, you know, we had him in our school, um, all day rolling with him. And um, what he, how he helped me was, A, he told me, he, he told me I had a black belt level guard. And I was like, oh, shit, I was a blue belt. And I was like, no, fuck, I was floating on a cloud of the line. And then he told me I had a white belt level forward game. And I was like, oh, shit. So, <laughs> I heard he was a really nice guy. Yeah, he was super cool. nice. He was guy. like the nicest, one of the nicest guys I'd ever met. So, so you know, I don't want to say timid, but like just nice, demure, you know, like, but um when he left, I said, all right, from this day forward, all because of conversations I had with him, I said, I, I'm, I'm going to start every match from my worst position, the position I hate the most, which at that time was side control. So for, for like five or seven years, every match, I would just turn sideways. And that's how it started because we had conversations and he was like, you know, even your game out, even it. Like, and now today, I don't care where I'm at. Like, like honestly, I don't. I really don't care who you are. I don't care how big you are. I don't care, but I don't care what position you get me in. I, I feel equally confident that you're not going to get me. I feel like I'm going to get out. I don't care if it's side control, mount, back, whatever, technical mount. Um, I've been in all those things so many times. I feel like I have. I feel like I have options. You know. So that that's a huge. If you're really trying to grow your game. 
instead of avoiding the, the one thing you hate the most, sure. go yeah. to it all the time. And what'll happen is, I don't know how long it'll take, it might take two months, three months, six months, talk to your, the people you're training with, your coach, whatever, and say, hey, how do I improve? And get to a point where you don't even mind that, and then go to the next worst one. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna end up with no position that you don't like, which is how I am today. Like, I, I don't care. I, I honestly don't have a worse position. I don't know what it would be. Like, I, I really don't care what position you start in. There's not a worse one for me today. I know I'm gonna get out. I, I have that confidence that I'm gonna get out. And that was all a result of how I changed my training after that Marcelo Garcia seminar. Because what I did have was, a, a, you know, I was a blue belt and my game was all based on guard. And once you passed my guard, you know, it was going downhill fast. Um, Alex, you gonna practice getting on a doggy? Doggy style? <laughs> no, what we need to do is even, <laughs> you need to go more Why fun to get out of that. He wouldn't. You need to go more fundamental and teach. Well, I learned it myself with teaching how to tie a belt. <laughs> no, no, uh, no. The that's strings. our job. That's our job. No, the strings. Like, I didn't know the string thing about the gi pans. You I didn't know it until, like, four pairs see, lost their strings. stuff you pick up over time. No, I mean, those would have been nice little things to learn. You pull the guy to the side and like, hey, man, let's go over here. I'll show you how to tie your belt. I, I, I've got blue belts that still wear their pants backwards. I'm like, because <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know that it has to loop through the, not, the, the thing. Yeah. So they, they just pull it, you know, I'm like. All right, I'm not gonna say anything. He's a blue belt. You gotta say things, coach. He he called me out like one time I was tired rolling, and I put my my gi back on to because I took it off because my balls were hot, and then I put it back on, and then uh, he's like, you know your your gi's on backwards, right? <laughs> I put it inside out. I was like, ah oh, shit. You mean outside in? Yeah, that's some same, that's shit. Same, same shit. It was it was backwards. He called me out on it, so appreciate that. What got you into jujitsu, Bobby? Voice Voice Gracie. H how did you meet him? Um, well, how I met him is I was training under uh, Larry Sheely. So like you, I saw the first. Like you, I, I trained a little bit of martial arts when I was a kid, and I just thought it was bullshit. I did like three months of time. Yeah, especially Mondo. when you watched the first UFC, and you're like, yeah, I just wasted like six years of my life. <laughs> I didn't waste that much. I, yeah. I wasted a matter of months. I wasn't sold. Like I took Taekwondo. And I was standing there doing this thing like this, and I'm yeah. like, I'm not gonna do that. If I, I'm, right. I'm gonna square up with someone, oh, 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 you know, don't yeah. do that, you know? I was like, why am I doing, like I had enough common sense, I was like, the fuck is this? What How long I, did like, you do it You for? show me, just like three months. It was like, so you were wearing a black belt yet? I, I, I think, I, I, think I got my you. yellow belt, whatever the second belt was. I think it was a yellow, because I remember fighting this girl that was a green belt, like we had to spar with them. And I have two nieces that do Taekwondo, like Karate America, and I go, I went to go, she was getting her belt ceremony, so I went to go support, whatever. And they're like, I think they're like, well, I know this answer, six and three, six and four. And they have like teenagers or black belts teaching. Yeah. I'm like, oh, they think about yeah. a black belt after six months. I'm like, how can you be a black belt? I got a great story. But I mean, it's, I still got to finish my story, guys. But. I, 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 I <laughs> got something really funny when my, my kid was doing Taekwondo and his uh, six years old or whatever, and he was belt ceremony. And they offered me for $25 for him to bump up to the next belt. Of course. I could have bought him the yeah. next higher belt. Yeah. I'm like, I will slap you right now in the face. <laughs> and, and, and just because you're a black belt, you can't do anything about it because I can kick your ass out in the parking lot <laughs> yeah. because you're a joke. Yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, but anyway. Yeah. Coach. To, sorry, so, coach. So, wow. no, that's all right. So basically it was the same thing. Like I just didn't believe that it was teaching me anything functional. And, I, and like quite honestly, my senior, year of, my senior year of high school, I got in a fight with a black belt. And, and people were afraid of him because he was a black belt. But I just smacked him with the tray. Like we were in the lunch line. <laughs> <laughs> And I just smacked him with Prison the rules. tray, right? Yeah, it, it, it fucked him up, man. It was like everyone separated it, and I was like, oh, man, this dude. I was in my head. I was like, this, I was a dirty fighter anyway. It's like, I, the guys, my, All is fair. I was taught that there is no such thing. That's, there's no such thing as fair in a fight, right? And I learned that early on. The dude never messed with me again. It was like, and I was just like, I'm not impressed, man. I'm just, I just wasn't impressed. Don't get me wrong. Today, I know that there's a huge value in, um, oh, hold on. Today I know that there's a huge value in striking and Taekwondo, karate, yeah. all that. Like, when you couple that with jujitsu, and even yeah. not, like it's still better than nothing. Um, but the, the six month black belt shit, like you, you got to be like Lyoto Machida or something. Like you have 15, 20 years of striking, and like a few years, even a year is beneficial. But yeah, it's not beneficial. Speed and accuracy. But as soon as that dude gets you on the ground, all that's out the door, yeah. right? And and most fights are a bigger dude versus a smaller dude. And that's what the bigger dude's trying to do. He's going to get you on the ground. He's going to football tackle you. He's going to. So, point of it is, you you need grappling. So I saw Hoist in, in '93, 
uh, that for, and I was like, oh shit. And I, from then on, I never missed for like 10 years. I never missed a single UFC. And then Pride was well, J Japan Valley two day, Japan Valley Tudo was going on. Hickson was dominating that. That turned into Pride. Pride. I never missed a Pride ever. Yeah, I never the best. Pride was the best. I never missed one ever. But I remember in, in 2003, I saw some dude training. Now, I always wanted to learn, but I was like, you, you can't. It's not in America. You know, if I in 2003, I saw some dude with a Hoist Gracie shirt on at the gym, and I walked up, and I was like, dude, that's fucking badass, right? I was a huge fan. He's like, oh, they're opening one, right, you know, right at the road. And I was like, oh, shit. So I went there and talked to the guy, and I was his first sign-up. So the day it opened, uh, I was there. It was January 1st, 2003 was the day it opened. And actually, I'd found out that he was training. He said, well, in the meantime, I'm training at this guy's school named uh, – um, I can't remember his name now, but he had he had Hawaiian jiu-jitsu. Um, um, so I uh, – God, oh. It was a student of Bill Peach, and I can't remember his name. But anyway, I went there and started training because I found out that the Hawaiian, the guy was impressed with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Hawaiian Jiu-Jitsu had some grap ground grappling, and he was kind of expand, you know, he was he was kind of tr doing his best to teach Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and it's kind of Hawaiian Jiu-Jitsu. So I started training a few months before 2003, and then when Larry opened his school in January 2003, I was his first student. So that that that's when I started my training, and. Um, his gym's um, down in Mayport, correct? It's in Mayport, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's a little bit older. He 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 was flying to the Gracie Academy. He was in pharmaceutical sales. He made really good money. You know, like back in the early '90s, he was making like two. You know, probably not my business to say what he was making, but he was making a lot of money. Yeah. And he would just like fly to the Gracie Academy all the time. And he would fly back. He was a blue belt under Horian and Hoyce. And when Hoyce separated ways, Larry went with Hoyce. And um, so he was a blue belt. I got my blue belt in 10 months. And Larry and I were both blue belts. Larry was a few stripes ahead of me. And Larry ended up leaving Hoist. And when he left Hoist, I kind of went directly under Hoist. I started. What was, so, here, so here's how it goes down. I'll probably. Um, I met a club. In California, though, correct? Like what? Hoist. Yeah, but he would, he would fly out here. He would, he would come hang out because he had, he had schools in. He had some guys that had been training under him in North Carolina. So when he separated, he already had a few schools. He had North Carolina. He had he had a few schools in Florida. He had John Burke in Orlando. He had Rob Kahn. He had Harlan Taylor. He had um, Billy Dowie. He had um, uh, he had a really good stable of fighters, like tough, badass dudes. That the, man, these guys were uh, kind of legends at the time. Uh, Ho Hoist gave out like seven black belts all at once, and they was all mostly on this side. They were most kind of mm. on the southeast. Mm. So that was cool because they'd come, they'd come teach our, our school. You know, was, I, I got to train with John. I got to train with Harlan. I got to cha train with uh, Steve Hall. I got to train with and these guys were at the time, in my opinion, you know, legends. They were they were crazy advanced. And um, so when Larry split, I went with Hoyce. Um, I, I became his representative. I ended up moving to the Philippines, and I, I opened Gracie Cebu with Hoyce's consent. You know. And that was really up in, up until then. Our, our relationship was really kind of informal, you know. Like I, I, and I, I communicated with via email. But then one day he called me. Uh, he called me in the Philippines. He's like, "Hey, Bobby." I could hear his voice. I was like, "This is fucking voice." And I'm like, "Hey, what's up?" He goes, I'm, "Me and me and my brother are going to be in Manila, um, doing the Ring of Fire. You know, it was Gokor versus Hoist. You know, Hoist's team versus I think Ken Shamrock had a team. I think Tito Ortiz had a team. There's all these teams, right?" And uh, he invited me to come hang out with him. And I was like, he's like, yeah, man, come out in Manila, hang out. You know, you show us around, whatnot. I go up there. I'm having dinner with Hoist and Hoyler. And I'm like, this is the, and I'm watching guys, you know, I'm watching Gokor walk by. I'm watching uh, Ken, or uh, uh, what's his name? Um, um, he lost to Gordon Ryan um, just in this last EBI. Big Josh. Josh Barnett. Josh Barnett. Oh. Um, yeah, man, it was, and I'm cool. just like, I thought it was pretty cool because I'm like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the crew, you know, I'm hanging out. And, and that's when me and Hoyce kind of became friends. And then he was like, man, I got to come down here. We got to hang out. And then I started setting up seminars. We started traveling around Euro uh, Asia. Then we did a European tour. And it was pretty cool because I'd get all kinds of training with him. We'd, every once in a while, we'd go to a gym and just be a small group. We'd go over some stuff. And, and um, that's how it went. I, I went. I went from... I went from, you know, nothing on my belt to four strike round under Hoist. And I left Hoist in I think 2012, 11 or 12. And you know, I kind of had a I just disagreed 
I just disagreed. I mean, this is really sensitive to talk about because I know, you know, I wouldn't doubt it if the conversation goes back. And I, but I just kind of disagreed. I didn't, I didn't like the fact that I was getting judged by people I didn't know. So what happens is the, 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 he, he, he partnered up with the Valente brothers, and um, I had no problem with that. I had no problem with what they were teaching. We would go down there two weeks at a time. I went down there a few times. Then they have this grading. They're grading me from a black belt. And Hoist didn't, it wasn't up to Hoist. Th these guys that I didn't know gr graded me. And I felt like my technique, I, I know that's wrong to say, like looking back, is, that's dead wrong. It's not for me to believe. But this, this what, that wasn't the issue. The issue wasn't my, wasn't my technique. You know, you had, you had to have one of the Valente brothers to sit there and grab you like a like, hundred moves you got to show. You just got to sit there and go through them back to back, no break. You're just sitting there, every self-defense move. And uh, the, the black belt test is all based on the self-defense moves, which I've, I'd been studying for years. But they called me on my lifestyle. So at the end, they get, you get called back in there, and they're like, yeah, man, do you, do you smoke? I'm like, no, I don't smoke. And they're like, oh, do you drink? I'm like, no, I don't drink. And they're like, and they said, well, we don't think you're li living the Gracie lifestyle. So they failed me on my lifestyle. And when I thought back about it, and I was like, the night before, all these black belts, I, I was kind of celebrating because you test the night before or something like that. And I, was, I had some drinks with my wife. I'm at a table, and I'm like, I don't normally drink. But I had a couple of drinks. This is like a one-off thing for me. This is like I'm here for my test. I kind of, I kind of assumed I was going to pass. But they called me out on my lifestyle. And I, they failed me because of my lifestyle. And I actually lead a healthy lifestyle, right? If you know me, you know, I, I, I'd say I lead, lead a pretty healthy yeah, lifestyle. I'd say I'm in the upper 10%, if not 5%. And I'm like, you don't even know me. And, you, and I know that's what it's about. Because I remember when I was drinking, I'm sick, I had like a Mai Tai or something, you know, frou-frou drink. I call them a frou-frou drink, right? But I remember looking over at the group of guys, and they, they kind of saw me and kind of was like, you know, like looking like, and uh, they literally told me I failed based on lifestyle. They said, we don't think you're, they literally right there, big group of them, they said, you're not living the Gracie lifestyle. And I was like, I'd hung out with Hoist all this time, and Hoist knew I didn't drink. Hoist knew it. Hoist, Hoist. I'd, I'd been out with Hoist so many times. He knows I'm not a party animal. He knows it. He knows that sometimes I would even stay out. I, I'd stay in my hotel. They'd go out, you know. And uh, I was just so pissed off that that happened. And then I was pissed off that the, he, he had a guy under him for like three years or something that he gave black belt to. And it's like I'd been under him for like 11 years. And I'm just like, oh, you know, I just looking back, I, it's not for me to say. It's for him to say, you know, and, and maybe it was wrong for me to leave, whatever. You know, you can't question looking back, looking back. I, I was wrong. Like l looking back, I can say that um, because it's not for me to say. It's not it's not for it's not for you to say. It's just for, you know. My feelings were hurt is what it comes down to. My feelings were hurt. Um, and realizing I made that mistake of jumping ships, right? Like, it wasn't a mistake to go to Luis. Luis was the best guy I could have went to. I always admired Luis. He was really cool. I liked the fact that I could speak openly with him. I wasn't, you know, that he, I, I got treated as an equal. You know, he, wasn't, he didn't have this diva side to him. You know, it was like, but, um, but I realized that, jumping ships is, is wrong you can't like no matter what your reasons are they're typically wrong it's it's not for you to say you know hoist could have kept me a brown brown belt another year or two it wouldn't have made a difference it wouldn't have made a difference it wouldn't have impacted me my if anything it would have made me better but um i'll never jump ship again right like i'm with luis until the end um <clears throat> just because i realize now that that wasn't the right thing to do right, right. do you still talk to hoist you guys still friends um just to kind of let me know i think um the last time we communicated, which was cool, he, he called me and said, uh, hey, Bobby, my, my brother's coming to town, uh, Holker, to, to get, you know, do you, you want him to drop by your school and give a seminar? So that was cool. Like, we were on good terms. I, I obviously welcomed his brother, and his brother came in and gave a great seminar, and we were happy, and, and I'd have any of his brothers. If he ever, if him or any of his brothers ever called me again, I'd be happy to host him. Um, so I think, yeah, we're, we were on good terms. You know, I haven't tried to call him because it's, all, like, I don't know what, I follow him on Instagram, like so. He looks like he's having fun. He's traveling. He's doing. Oh, like, he's having fun. He's doing uh, combat, like um, with weapons, though, like with uh, firearms. Like he's into guns. That right he's now. into guns. Well, yeah. Yeah. What, when what he what he wanted to do is he wanted he wanted to go shooting. That's what he wanted to do. It's like Are when he was like, coming, he wanted he wanted a shooting range lined up. And I'll be honest, he could he outshot out of all of Jacksonville's uh, SWAT team. Like he he is a he's a fucking ridiculous with a gun like he would he would get in bets with the 
the SWAT team, and he'd be like, fuck the target. He's like, let's see who can shoot the target off the off the little thing it's holding it on. I can't remember if it was a rubber band or whatever it was, and first shot, pff, dropped the target, and I'm just like, damn, man, he, he, he is... He's vicious. Yeah, he could be a professional shooter. He could make money shooting. Wow. He is he is in that highest level of shooting. And that's what he's into, though. That's all he wants to do. Everywhere he goes, he wants to shoot guns. He shoots them from helicopters. He shoots, you know. Damn, that must be nice. Yeah. I love shooting, too. Like, I'm yeah, I mean, helicopter shooting, I get more than that. Yeah. Well, he's, you know, everywhere he goes, he's got some rich dude that wants to take him out. And so, yeah. like, boat yeah. rods, whatever. It was cool being, the cool thing about being in Asia with him was um, you had all these rich guys, like, in Europe, or, or in, uh, let's say, um, well, everywhere we went. And they were catching it. Like, traveling in Europe, um, I kind of presented myself as his manager. It's kind of a little bit misleading, you know, like, I was the manager of the trip. But anyway... They'd put me up in hotel rooms. They'd put him in a nice hotel room. Well, as a result, I'd be in a nice hotel room. Some places, they'd pick us up in a limo, and they'd cover all the meals. I was like, yeah, eat whatever you want. Nice as shit. And I'm just there like, yeah, me too, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like quietly getting my food, you know, whatever. But it was pretty cool. We did get – we. it was cool traveling with him. Um, I remember one time we were in this club, and uh, – he had on this jacket and it kind of had like spikes on the end. Like it was kind of like a real retro looking jacket, like something out of the Matrix, but more, more risque, right? And something like, out of Michael Jackson. Yeah, yeah. And like some, <laughs> some dude just kind of said something to him. Like he kind of, he kind of just assumed Hoist was like a punk, or like a little, really? like, you know? Yeah, because yeah, Hoist isn't a big guy. He's only like 178 pounds or something, right? Yeah. But the dude kind of, just kind of, you could see. He, he didn't see Hoist as any threat whatsoever. Just like kind of this, just something. But Hoist let it go. Hoist didn't care. Hoist is like, Hoist knows it fuck him up, right? But it was just funny, like when you're out, um, Hoist is very, um, he didn't give a damn if you, oh, it's hard to explain. Like if you disrespected him, like I, he's down to fight. There's no doubt about it. He, he'll fight you right then and there. And I don't think it'd just be a nice but he didn't, fight either, though. He's I'd not. be a nasty fight. He's not so. Uh, Probably a quick one. Yeah. We were at a club in Jacksonville. It was a whole group of us. It was like like ten, fifteen jujitsu practitioners, blue to black. You know, brown belts. Big John Burke was there. I was there. I don't remember. Maybe, maybe John John wasn't there. But Ryan Brinkman was there. Ryan Murphy was there. Um, Larry Sheely was there. There was a big group of us. And Hoist is up against the wall. I'm up against the wall. And this guy, this bodybuilder's walking through, and we're, we're like across from the bar, and there's like a narrow walkway, like three feet or something. And this dude's walking this way, and this girl's walking, and they just, the girl and the dude kind of meet right in front of Hoist. And the dude's just talking to the girl, like, hey, girl, whatever. And then he ends up kind of shifting. They kind of end up turning sideways a little bit, and they're blocking the walkway. But the dude's a big guy. He's like, he don't care. He's like, I'm fucking, you know, I'm fucking all roided out. Well, he's got his back to Hoist. And it's kind of disrespectful. He's yeah, in Hoist. He is, like, Hoist is kind of holding his drink water. Hoist only drinks water. He's kind of holding his drink, like, in his, and I'm like, but Hoist doesn't say anything. You know, he's kind of a, he's a, he's a chill dude. This dude named Ryan Murphy, and Ryan's a nut. He's like Henry. Ryan's basically Henry, right? Like, he has no filter. So Ryan tapped this dude on the shoulder, and the dude's like, what? You know, like, he's a big dude, right? The dude's fucking jacked, right? But he turns around. And he's like, what? He goes, and Ryan stoned. He's like, hey, dude, you know who that is? And the dude's like, he looks and he goes, who? And he goes, that's Hoist fucking Gracie. You know who Hoist fucking Gracie is? And he kind of, then the dude kind of like, he looks around and he sees like 10 of us. He sees Hoist and like 10 dudes kind of like triangles, you know. He's like, oh, shit. And he grabs the girl and he goes, come on, we got to go. Yeah. <laughs> it was funny. It was so fucking funny. That was one of the funniest things that ever happened was, was that dude realizing? Because at that time, Hoist was the he was the king of MMA. He, sure, no, he was absolutely. at this point in time he hadn't lost to anybody and he had beaten. You know, I would still to this day feel safe going out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> with just Hoist, like, yeah. come on, dude, we can walk down the sketchiest fucking alleyway. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll be safe if I'm with Hoist, man. Yeah, it was. Uh, and then another cool story I had about hanging out with Hoist is I set up when we were setting up seminars in Europe. We went to. Um, uh, Amsterdam. I did. We fucking set up a. We set up a. It was at this dude named Bart Arts. Uh, Mats was the name of his school, and it was just, it was in Breda. It was just outside of Amsterdam. But 
we're there, we're teaching, and they're like, dude, that's so cool that you all set up the seminar in, in Amsterdam, Amsterdam the yeah. same time as Hickson. Are we all hanging out with Hickson tonight? And I was like, I did. I set up a seminar the same time. <laughs> Hickson, yeah. and they're like, yeah, you didn't know? Right down the road, Hickson's giving a seminar. And I just thought, man, Hoist is here, and Hickson's here, and we're at the fucking party fucking place of Europe, Amsterdam. We're like right down the road. I'm sitting there thinking, we're going to go party in Amsterdam mm -hmm. with Hickson and Hoist. And I thought, this shit's getting ready to get lit as fuck, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the, they, they're like, are we, are we all going to hang out? You know, they're asking Hoist, and Hoist is like, yeah, you can call my brother and ask, you know? And I was like, oh, shit, it's going down. And he's like, but then I'm talking with Hoist. He goes, no, my brother won't go out. He's like, he's like I already know. He goes, they, they can call him, but he, he, he won't go out. He doesn't go out. And then they called him, and they're like, man, yeah, he's, he's not going to go out. And I was like, oh, fuck, man. But Hoist called it. He knew. He knew already. I just thought, how weird is that, that? These two brothers are on the other side of the world. You know, they're in, and one of the craziest places, Nether, if you, you know about Amsterdam, right? It's fucking right. insane. Yeah. Like, there's nothing illegal in that city. And I just thought, it, it's magical to be in. If you've ever, and I've been to Amsterdam multiple times, but it, it's like it's like a magical place to go. And I just thought, I'm going to be hanging out with Hoist and Hickson. But it was it was cool to even hang out with, with Hoist in Amsterdam. I sat down, we had dinner in there, we had drinks, you know. Um, it was a good time. That was a good time. But yeah, no, Hickson. Hickson never, he did, he did, apparently, if he's going to go out, it's only going to be with people that are very close to him. He's not, he's not down with that. He probably just doesn't want to be around idiots, though, too, you know? Like, yeah. someone, someone that dr doesn't drink and, you know, or so, smoke or do stuff. Yeah, like, it's not fun going out, yourself, being the sober one, that's for sure. want to be around sure. those people. You're babysitting us. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you'd be high, alert, kind of like, oh, God. I'm so I'd, I'd heard, guy. I'd heard later. Uh, and I have no idea if this this is pure this is pure hearsay, but it was someone who I, I, I kind of believe. I'm not going to throw them under the bus. Um, so I'd heard later that you know Hickson he lost one of his sons, Hoxson, right? Mm -hmm. Hoxson died, and there was there was a lot of uh, speculation about how Hoxson died, right? Like it, like might might have been gang related or whatever. I don't I, I don't know. There's there's been that speculations on the internet. You can hear other people talk about it, right? But um, so the person who told me said that, that Hickson didn't like to hang out with family members after that, after Hoxson died, because it brought back memories mm. of Hoxson, right? Like, so it's like he kind of avoided family members at that point. I don't know how true that is or not, but that's, mm. so maybe, maybe Hoist knew something that, you know, uh, but Hoist knew, Hoist, Hoist knew that Hickson wasn't going to hang, hang out, which I thought was odd. I was like, man, you're on the other side of the world and you, you just happen to be in the same city as your brother on the other side of the world. I mean, wouldn't you want to hang out? You know, that's... But have it, dinner, something. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I, and I thought I was in the crew that was gonna have dinner, so Grab I was like, Taco Loo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, it, but um, oh, Taco Loo in Germany, right? Or Japan? Uh, it was Germany. Germany. So, so one of my students. Uh, so, for you guys who don't know the little reference there, if you're in, if you're not from Jacks and you come to Jacks, we've got the best fucking. We've got this um, Tex-Mex. What do you call it? What is it? That cantina. Uh, yeah, Tex-Mex. Well, it's more Americanized, obviously. Yeah. Like the it's the best Mexican Royale. food I've yeah. ever had in my entire life. I wouldn't call it Mexican would, food, I but yes. I wouldn't call it Mexican. But yeah. Tex-Mex. I don't it's know. It's good. It's good. It's tacos. I wouldn't even call it Tex-Mex either. I still haven't got you to Pepe's house. It's tacos. Yeah. Okay? It's yeah. tacos. If you, you want the best tacos, and this is what's amazing. Not only are the, like they have this, now I'm, I'm, I'm vegetarian today. But I, before I was vegetarian, I used to eat their carne asadas and their carne royales. Royales fire. Yeah. Ten, oh, so you ten dollar been, tacos, you been baby. Veg, Vegemite vegetarian for uh, for about two years. Now. Two years only. <laughs> yeah, vegetarian. So um, Vegemite, Vegemite. I, they've got the best. It is lit, and it's only like three dollars a taco. Yeah, it's the like, price is great. It's in, and, and then they they they've got the, they've got the best chips yeah. and salsa I've ever had. Unlimited. <laughs> Margaritas will get you too. Yeah, yeah. all a house margarita. Oh my God. Margarita. It is cheap, so it's really really good. The ambiance is totally cool. Have you been outside? Have you been? Yeah, outside? all that. Yeah, they give you sweaters too. There's a back. Cold. Yeah. There's a back oh, porch. The yeah, back dude. is dope. The, yeah. It's got like this uh, luminescent painting of massive. It's the whole side of the building. The back is actually. Like this is the weather to eat. Next time we go, yeah. like right now, yeah, we, we should go outside. Out yeah. yeah, and they have heat lamps too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like right now I'm digging for weather. Right <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I finally cooled so, off. Man. Oh God. So, yeah. I, so I brought one of my students there, right? Amir. Amir is a is a, a super talented brown belt, and uh, he lives in K Town. He lives in Kaiser Kaiserslautern in Germany. But he used to train with me here in Jacksonville for you know for years. And he, you know, I've given him all his promotions. I'd, I'd go stay with him. He always invites me to stay at his house there, and his 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 family is real real. Um, 
nice to me. I was they just to let you know how cool he is. His they have a really nice. Uh, his dad bought a three, built a three-story house. We're talking a, a crazy dope house in Germany. And I'm over there visiting with, with Emir, and this is a brand new house. And they're like, well, we're going on vacation to Bosnia. Just, you know, stay in the house. Have fun. Here's the keys. And I'm like, they left and just left me there in their house. Sure so, uh, so, but Emir, Emir comes here, and we, we take him to... We take him to um, Taco Lou, and he loves it. He wants to eat Taco Lou every single night. Never had anything like it. So now he went back to Germany, and ever since he'd been working on everything, t testing out recipes, designing the logo. Well, a few weeks ago, he signed the uh, he signed the lease agreement, and he's opening his version of a Taco Lou in, in Kaiserslautern, Germany, which is that's, super cool. That's awesome. Cool. That is awesome. Dude, the Conor Royale is amazing. I, I enjoy cooking. I, I enjoy grilling, making food and stuff. But opening a restaurant, like, kind of scares me. Because it seems like it's a lot it's of It's a lot, yeah. It's a lot of work. It's going to take up every time. You know what I mean? Like, your whole life would probably have to be interested yeah. in that restaurant until it gets on its feet and it's self-sufficient, right? Probably that's probably what it's like with the, any the business. The problem I have with any business now today, like like what happened to me after what happened to me, and that's a that's a long story that I have to save for another time. But after what, so I used to have a, a, a you know a thriving business, and when one per when when you realize that one person can completely ruin you, I mean, completely. Like it only takes one cook to spit in the food on camera, and and you yeah. your business as a result is ruined from all your years of work, all your dollars of investment. It just takes one idiot, right? So I don't want to, after that, after what happened to me, and basically something very along those lines happened to me, it just took one idiot who was spiteful. Um, and really the spite is this. You made something of yourself, and they haven't yet. And as a result, they hate you be because of your success, yeah. and they feel like they're entitled, that, that money is easier for you, like, like somehow you didn't work for it, like it just magically happened, like you didn't put in 20-hour days for seven, eight years, like it just, you, you just, you just right. opened a business and people flooded you and you yeah. had, you know, like you didn't do any work to get there, right? It happened overnight. It just you're happened just, overnight. And, and you're, you're lucky. Just, you're just rich yeah. all of a sudden. Well, anyway, so people, people see that <coughs> and, and um, they, they, they just want a piece of it and they'll make up whatever lie they need to. And, and as a result of having dealt with that, I said, I don't ever want a business where I'm, where I'm dependent on anyone again. That's, that's what, I don't want to be, I'd rather work for someone else. I don't want to be dependent on another human being that can ruin me. So I will only own a bit, hence why we open a, you know, an online sales store is if me and Chin, if it gets too, too big where we can't handle it, we'll just sell it. Like I won't, I won't be obligated to anyone. Caveat though, like with the school, right? And I think um, me, me and uh, Paul, who's a purple belt in your school, we were having a conversation the other night, and I was and I was kind of telling him, I think I was like, I think Bobby wants a break. I think he wants some of the, you know, like obviously like you would love for all of us to be black belts. I think you've said that, but you can't. It's gonna take time. It takes investment, you know. But I, I feel like I do you want people break. teaching. You I, want other. You want your students like to be I super would love solid. It. Yes. Like and and I'm not gonna I'm not trying to boasters, but like me and Alex and Tom like. I mentioned you look at us and one day hope you're hoping in the back of your, I hope you're thinking that in the back of your mind we're teaching classes and, and kind of helping you and giving you a break absolutely you know? that's absolutely what I want I, like you have to understand no student should ever think that they're being held back they, they shouldn't they shouldn't think that because what what I want is more colored belts in my school. I, I need that. Yeah. I say need that people to come <laughs> in. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm racist right, right. towards white belts. <laughs> Dude, it's white belt power, bro. What I want, there's no instructor that doesn't want 10 black belts, 10 brown belts, 10. There's no instructor that doesn't want that. You want that. I, I need people to come in here and see that this school has a foundation. Of course I want that. I need... And honestly, there are instructors, I, I, I know of schools, at least one, that gives them out really fast for just for that purpose, so that when other people go in, and they're decent. You know, like, like if I look at his belts, his belts are decent. You know, it's like, they're not phenomenal, you know, and I'm not trying to turn out phenomenal. I have, for me, the, for me it's very simple to see a, a, a 
the differences. And we can talk about them. I'll t- I don't mind talking about them. I actually don't mind. Like, I, I don't mind. It's especially if you come to me and you're concerned or you're like, how do I get there? What am I doing wrong? There, there's no problem with that. Like, I, I'll never hold that against you. I don't care what conversation we have, and this is speaking to anyone, is that I'll never, I'll never penalize anyone against their belt. Never. It'll, never. it'll never happen. The day you're a blue belt, I'll give you your blue belt. The day you're a purple belt, I'll give you your purple belt, and so on. Um, for me, a, bl- a blue belt is very simple. It's clear domination over white belts. It's just right. new guys mm-hmm. come in that are your size, and you can pretty much tap them out at, at will. I mean, pretty much. There's, it's going to be a fight, don't get me wrong, but, but especially if you're a big guy, it's harder to prove. If, it's not only harder to prove, it's harder to earn. Hoist used to have a saying, and the saying was, and, and uh, the saying was, your size is your biggest gift, and it's your biggest curse. Right? That's a curse to you, your size, as far as jiu-jitsu goes. If you listen to Joe Rogan, he'll say, you want a good jiu-jitsu instructor? Go find a little guy. Go find a little guy. The big guy doesn't have to master technique to beat you. He, he, he's not forced to. He can, he can use his muscle. The little guy, the only way he could ever build an audience is to master that technique, was to truly employ technique. The only way I could beat you, the only one. So you want, you want a good instructor? Go to the little guy. Don't go to the big guy. The big guy can cheat. He, he, he doesn't have to have perfect technique. And that's the problem if you're a big guy. If you're a big guy, you can employ your muscle. A perfect example is Stewart. When Stewart came here, he was a national wrestling champion. He was already a purple belt. He, he understood techniques. But he was using all his power. So when I was fighting him as a purple belt, Jesus Christ, man, it always hurt. There was never a time. It always Imagine. hurt. It was, there was no good memories of fighting him. You're talking when you were rolling with him every day? Yeah, every day there. he lived here. He lived yeah, here for three right. months. You know, his jaw was yeah. 30 pounds. <laughs> he's, he's, <laughs> he's, so he's got cool. the Adonis he's, genetics. Yeah, he's great. He doesn't even work out. If he worked out, he'd be, he'd be, he could be on any level, and he is on any level. I mean, the dude's big enough and, and good enough. And he's yeah. smart. I shouldn't man. even I, say I, big. He but just, he's, he's also good. very intelligent. Yeah, he's very intelligent. Chess champion. The dude's, he's really good. Really? Yeah, he's very, he's very, he's very cerebral. Alex is good at chess, too. So, well, but he looks like Superman. That's <laughs> different. Um, Clark Kent. But w- so, w- and me and Stewart had these talks a lot. And Stewart, we took Stewart to Brown Belt, but he finally got it. Like, like when I say he finally got it, like Stewart. Well, I remember, I remember one day I was training at Luis's. I go over to Luis's. Not enough. I need to go there more because that is my professor, and that's where my source of knowledge is supposed to come. And that's kind of where I was getting at is like leaving the school to to us or to the to the other belts so that you can have yeah. that time. I wasn't I wasn't bring. It was my this, intent wasn't the belts. Yeah. It was my intent. On, on what I was taught, what I was yeah. kind of gearing towards is you want time just so you can do that. Yeah. And you can leave your schoolhouse to your higher yeah. belt instructors. That that's kind of where I was leaning towards. Yeah, so Does we'll come back sense? to that. Yeah, Does we're going to come back to that. Yeah. But just to go on to Stuart, because if I leave it where it was, it sounds bad. Um, I remember I was over there, and he was a brown belt, and fucking huge. And, I, and then I was like, I got, I'm, I'm rolling with higher level belts. You know, I'm rolling black belt, black belt, brown belt. And then next, switch, 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 and then there's Stuart. And I'm like, fuck. Because I've gotten <laughs> older, I've gotten smaller, I've gotten weaker, he's gotten bigger and better, and I'm just thinking of the maulings we used to go through, and I'm just like, God dang, man. Not again? I can't. <laughs> and then he rolled like a butterfly. I was just like, oh, shit. And I was like, man, he, he, he turned his strength into my strength. He, he limited his strength to my strength. And I was like, oh, and I'm, you know, the, the fight became fair for the first time in history, and he beat me with technique. You know, he, he did he didn't. I think he beat me that day. I think I think he, we might have. I think he beat me that day. Um, and we've now he's he's came and visited me and, and we've sparred and I would I would roll with him all day every day. I could honestly I'd, I'd probably have less injuries than rolling with someone else smaller. I could roll with him like the like on it like not not to be negative or degrading in any way. Just to be honest. Just to be 100 percent honest. If I roll with you, Alex, I'm usually in pain. I'm I'm usually in pain. If I roll with Brendan, I'm usually in pain. Really. Yeah, I mean, I hate to say it, but you, you guys bring a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of pressure and smash. It's like, you may not realize that. Um, if I roll with Jason, little, little pain. If I roll with Henry, a lot of pain. <laughs> a lot of pain. Because Henry just, 
Henry is like a the, the inertia of a gun sh of a of a shotgun just poof, and then it just goes in all directions it's just it's like and and I have to move so much with Henry a rubber ball on a, with a shotgun <laughs> yeah it's just everywhere yeah. It's, it's so much power and it's so much energy and he has so much stamina and he has so much strength and he's so wiry and flexible honestly I I t so to be honest and fair just so you don't feel totally bad and not to make Henry feel bad but just to be honest I hurt the most rolling with Henry like of all people I can roll with because I have to, the only way I can beat Henry is to employ, I used to be like Henry from a flexibility standpoint and from a you know speed, st I was light, I was flexible. I have to employ those things, which I, I, I don't have to employ those so much on you guys. Well, you guys aren't speeding around me. I'm not having to flex out of things. And I, I try, because I know your back interest. Like, I try not to crank you too hard to the side. That, that the, um, the guard pass with putting the knee and cranking you to the side, like, I really hated to try to do that on you. Yeah. But, I, but you were saying, like, that's the best one. It's so you're going to get on it. You're going to get on it. Yeah. So, it, I'm not saying you're going to kill me every roll. I'm not saying I'm better. But at the same time, like, I know you're injured, too. Like, I'm not trying to put, you know. I'm yeah. just not trying to muscle you all the time. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> so, but anyway, so, um, Stewart. There are certain guys I can go with that I, now, I, believe it or not, I can go with Nikki for an hour and there's no, there's no pain with Nikki. She goes hard. Like, like the, the, the pain I'll get from Nikki will be like abrasions or a bruised nose or a bruised eye. Like, Cut she, eye. yeah, like, she, like, bust her eye like open. She, she wants a war. That's okay. She wants a battle, but, but she doesn't have enough weight. Uh, she's not fast. She doesn't make me go faster than I normally go. Um, she doesn't have enough weight to really hurt my spine or anything like that. So if I keep it under 170, I could do that. I could do that, and my body would probably recuperate, right? But when I start going above 200, and guys really want to test me, and I understand they do want to test because they feel like this is how I get my blue belt. I show him that I can beat him, but that's really not the way. That's not. That's really not the way. The way is to sh try to be smooth and to try. Uh, like w one of the reasons you get so tired is because you, you you you're using a lot of power, right? You use a lot of power when you roll. You're using it with technique. You're using good techniques. You're learning good techniques. He's talking Alex. But the, but the reason you can't go for an hour right I'm now is because you're using power all the time. And what you... Brendan what, has all the power. The self-defense, like the gr true Gracie Jiu-Jitsu is only using power in little spurts, right? If you ask me. My, my, like, that's how Alio could... It's the only way Alio could go... Like, if you want to know what true gray, uh, uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu is, all you have to do is analyze uh, Alio versus Masahiko Kimura, right? Or when he, when he fought Kimura in Japan. It's, it's a very little guy versus a very big guy, reserving your energy and, and not just constantly trying to muscle, but just waiting, waiting for, waiting for that, that opportunity when you know it's there and then going for it. And then using perfect balance and not making one mistake, and not, but not muscling all the time, instead trying to trying to get into a position and trying to win with technique, trying to tone down your power, trying not to use all your power. And that's how I'm trying to steer our training, right? Like that's how I'm trying to, you know, hey, let's get rid of the ego, let's tap, let's mm -hmm. use less muscle. But, but, you know, the way I go, I can't outmuscle you. There's no way. I can't beat you with power. There's, I will lose against with power, right? Now, it, what you're doing, the way you're going is natural. Again, Stewart's fucking cerebral as hell and he didn't figure it out till brown belt so you're not off track you're on track I, I, you're I, it's very hard no matter and no matter how much Stuart respected what I told him and, and I know he had a respect for what I was telling him it's it's so uh, innate for us to fight you know for us to use that power so it's incredibly hard to try to turn that off because you have to lose even more I think initially um, but it does, with or without that power, your, your, your path to blue belt for me, because I'm a professor and I get to choose how, why, why, why my guys, it's, it's a clear domination of blue belts, but also a minimum requirements. Not everyone's going to get promoted when they hit the minimums. I don't just, and there are people that are kind of past due. If you look at my system, there's people that are training that says they could be higher and you, you have to meet the minimum requirements, and I have to think you're at that level, right? So you once you hit the minimum, minimum requirements, now, I will be honest. I get that. As far as white belts go, you just about always hit blue belt 
when you hit my minimum requirements, just about. I don't want to say it's guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. But I think I teach like 100 times more than most instructors do. You think if you've been to 200 of my classes, I give fucking 50 minutes of technique in a class, 10 techniques a night. We rep, and then it's, you know, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of technique. And I think some, some people, I listened to an argument last night. I hate to be so talkative, but last night I listened to Ben Askren say on Joe Rogan's show. Anyone know who Ben Askren is? Oh, yeah. You know who Ben mm -hmm. Askren is? He's a two-time no. Olympic wrestler, and he's an MMA fighter. Oh, the curly hair guy. Yeah. yeah. yeah, 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 yeah and he really says, people. he was on Joe Rogan's He says, yeah, podcast. he was on Joe Rogan's mm -hmm. podcast. Okay. And he says, yeah, all, you know, 99% of jiu-jitsu schools are doing it wrong. They're doing it wrong. And I listened to it, and I'm not trying to be con condescending about the guy doing it wrong, you know. But I was like, wow, what are we doing wrong? Let me listen to this. And he says, yeah, they're doing it wrong. They go in there, and they show a technique, and they rip it five times. They show a technique, they rip it five times. He goes, the way we do it. The way we, he goes, I know, I, I'm, I'm a two-time Olympian. I, I build world champions. I work with world champions. I, I'm not being condescending. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this for a reason. He said these things, and let's listen to what he didn't realize about what he's saying. What we'll do is we'll go in there, and we'll fucking do a snap down for fucking three hours. You know, what, I'm exaggerating. He may not have said snap down. But basically, they'll drill a move until they're sick of it. They'll just sit there, you know, double leg, double leg, double leg, all day, an hour, double leg, double leg, double leg. And he goes, you know, this is how we teach techniques. This is how we do it. We drill the shit out of a move. And I'm like, that's, that's great. That works. There is no question about that. Do you know how many of my kids would quit if I did that in one day? If I brought in our kids' class and uh, I made everyone do double legs for, let's just say, an hour. He, he, they're, they're talking about hours of this. Let's just say I did it for an hour. They'd fucking hate it. They'd fucking hate it. First off, kids think, after I've done it three times, I got it, you know? Yeah, Secondly, the amount of work and sweat, the, the, the girls, I'm out, see y'all later, not for me, I'm gonna go do ballerina, whatever, I'm gonna do gymnastics. So, that's not the best mentality for everyone. Number one, let's look at, let's look at his first assumption he didn't realize he said. I make world champions, Olympians, I train, okay. If you're trying to be a world champion, I agree with you, if that's your goal. If you're trying to make world champions, yes, you need to train like this. What if I'm trying to teach people self-defense? Jiu-Jitsu schools aren't doing it wrong. We're teaching 45-year-old women who have kids and they have jobs and they're, they're overweight. You're gonna, t you're gonna make them do 100 fucking double things? <laughs> the fuck are you thinking, bro? Right? Or if they're the one getting taken yeah. down 100 times? Yeah, if that's, you wanna make a world champion, absolutely. But I say I can give you the knowledge of Ben Askren in five years. You can have the same knowledge as him. And then you can be as physical as you want. And then if you want to be a world champion, you can rep the shit out of those moves to complete perfection. Mm. I can take anyone in the world and give them the knowledge of a black belt in five years. I'm not saying I'll make them a black belt in five years. I may make them wait till they master the shit in eight years. I think that teaching to the smartest guy and inundating them with knowledge and doing this day after day after day is the best, best method. And if that guy would dare argue with me, he will cut his income in half. If he'd say, well, no, that's not the best method, is a seminar beneficial? Do you pay to go to seminars? Yes, you do. You pay a lot of money. That's where you spend the most amount of your paying for training, right? To go to a seminar. What do you get in a seminar? You get a lot of moves. It, you don't go to a seminar and a dude rep one move. One, right one move. You you're going to go to a seminar and you're going to get 10 moves. And you paid a lot of money for that. Why? Is it a lie? Is a seminar not beneficial? No, it is beneficial. I teach like every class is a seminar. All my, the difference between me and, me and um, another school is if you go to a, the way it's typically ran, a typical school, at three years in, you're still seeing new moves. At Purple Belt, you're still learning new moves from your professor. They're teaching three moves a night. You know, they got 30 minutes of calisthenics, and they're teaching three moves a night. With me, in a year, you've seen every move I have to teach. I get year. surprised at this point if I see something you haven't shown yeah. before. And, and by year... I get surprised if I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so old. I'm sorry. I'm fucking <laughs> sorry. By year, th by year two or three, you've repped everything I know umpteen times. 
You have the knowledge of a black belt by year three. Like, That's what I mean. I don't know. Yeah. You know and then I mean? it's just a matter of repping and repping and repping. repping right, right. And that happens by year five, six, seven, eight. You have all that knowledge, right? You have, I, I think, I think, you know, I know it's egotistical, but I'm just being honest. I'm not, I'm not trying to be egotistical. I'm just being honest. I think I create more knowledgeable belts. I do. I think that my guys know more. I think if we took a three-year practitioner at some really fucking good school and took my guy three years, like let's put Jason, someone that's been with me three years. Jason hasn't even been with me three years. He's been with me more like, he's actually trained about two, right? He's here at another school before here? No. He'd never done any jiu-jitsu or any grappling, any wrestling, nothing. But, but he goes around other like. But one third of the time, he's at, he's out he's out sea out to sea at least one third of the time. That's so in three years, he's trained for two. And suspect. We don't know what he's doing. Uh, conspiracy. And this is a shout out. To you me. take a guy that's trained two years. Show me a guy that's trained two years that knows more than Jason. Bring bring me that guy. That's bring, legit. Bring me that that guy. Like he he studies constantly. Like while he's out here out now, he's bring like me, memorizing shit. Bring me the girl. Bring me the girl that's better than Nikki at, at, at less than three years in. She's impressive. Bring, me, about, bring her to me. Bring her to me. Put her, put her, let's let them go five, five times. See what happens. I mean, that was kind of proven though at the, the Friday Night Finishers, that one little con I think I think that was like the first competition I seen, I saw or watched Nikki compete in. Um, and it was a 16 girl, if, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it, was, it was a lot of girls. It was a lot of girls that she competed against. Older girls, I mean, and... At, at that, and uh, she lost her first match, but then went went beat across that girl twice. Yeah, beat, went across and came back to the first person the she lost to. She, from, yeah, and and made her way up and and, and won gold. Let's talk about why she oh. lost that first match, though. Like like the girl she lost to, she ended up coming back beating twice. She lost that first match because she was listening to me. I don't know if you noticed. I don't know if you went back and. I remember you mentioning that. She yeah, she. Yeah. What happened is I started yelling for her what to do. She had the girl in a triangle dump. She had well. her, yeah, and I said triangle dump. Tri and Nikki doesn't use triangle dump, but she knows what it is. If I would have, if she would have executed her game, she would have had that girl right then and there. But I got her to, and she lost on. She, I can't remember how she lost, but she, yeah, she lost. She lost. She had the win. She triangle dumped. She started the wrong listening way or to me. Yeah, she went to the wrong side yeah. or something. And then the girl got out, and I should have I should have shut up and just let the girl do her own jujitsu. And I've lost listening to, you know, it's happened to me before. And, so. and I've noticed that everybody's talking during, you know, like you. And I'm not gonna name names, but you, yeah, one person saying something, another person saying something, another person saying something, like, you know. Well, the last fight I was in, you were my coach, obviously, and I did that one legged takedown, and I brought him down, and I heard you. Clear as day. It was like keep on, keep on driving, keep on driving. Because I wasn't gonna drive anymore. I thought this is done. I can't bring him down any further. And I heard you clear as day, and I kept on driving, and I got, I got side control from that. Yeah. And then I like the way, you, like I watch other coaches, like they've been in a few tournaments now. God, they're obnoxious. You know, not they're not be mean or anything, but they are. Like I can out, like three different moves. Yeah. Do, do like, this, do this, I can this, barely and then hear that. what you're saying. You know, I, and you know we have great fans and checkmate. They're yelling things too. And then here I am just trying not to die. I just yell, go best friend, go best yeah. friend, go when you're, but, when you're... But with coaches, like, if coach is even talking, it's because it's extremely important. Yeah. So I'm going to... I, I can listen. Yeah. yeah, at this point, there's still... There's things he says, like, do this. And I'm like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know if this was, a, like, a, a post thing because of what happened with you and Nikki or if this is how you always been, but I like it. I mean, right before the fight, you were like, hey, do your jiu-jitsu, do what yeah. works. And if I think you're doing something super stupid... I'm going to say something. That's how I am. I don't. Yeah. The coaches that walk their student through everything, I think that student's operating at a half a second lag. If, they're, if your Absolutely. student is trying to, if the coach is trying to walk the student through the entire competition and the student's even listening, you've got a lag going on. So there should be like the next move. Well, Versus yeah. what you're supposed to get out of now, you do your black belt shit with the, with the third and the fourth move, right? Like, I mean, I can also say dude, it's, it's a little cheating too. That, because like, you know, you right? got two people who have been training we're using what they know, but now the puppeteers, the coaches are telling you, it's like in tennis, you can't do that. You can't get no coaching in tennis during a match. Cause that's, that's against the rules. You're giving me answers. As I always thought it was a little weird too. Like, oh, like his guard's open. Like you're yelling, he, he doesn't know my guard's open, yeah. but now he does because the opposite coach has yelled yeah. it to him. The first so that's a little time weird. me and Tom rolled, it was like, it was, it was weird. That, right? that was remember, weird. I didn't feel right weird, about that. Cause it was like, it was towards the end of the night. It was just, you know, it was open mat at the school. But it was like Craig started, or I didn't even bring in names, but one of the one <laughs> yeah. of the guys started started coaching you, and then 
one of my buddies started coaching me, and I was like, what the hell is going on? And you swept me, and you got me. Well, but, but with the coaching and, the coaching, and do this, so do that. Weird. Well, the thing that really was weird is when Craig jumped on my back. Well, we're not talking about names. That could, that oh, could be an I, I think, <laughs> I, So then I was just kind of like, like, this whole thing feels dirty. You know, I don't want it to, to be like that. It was, it was odd. I, and I think uh, – he, it's all he, fun. He just wanted me to, you know, enjoy myself as like the first class he'd seen me at, and you know, people. I just wanted to wanna anaconda you. Well, not really anaconda. I just wanted to slang you with my dick. So. <laughs> oh, going back to. <laughs> all over your face. Going back to, uh, you know, <laughs> Master Luis, right? Yes. And. Um, Which. You know, Master he's Luis having a seminar Todd, tomorrow. Todd Williams brought yeah tomorrow tomorrow night. Uh, Todd Williams brought um, Master Luis to Jacksonville. He's the one who reached out to him and told him, hey, there's this need for you. You know, kind of come here. Because uh, that's the source. Luis. He was up in Carolina, correct? Who? Master Luis. Like, he hated the weather somewhere. I don't remember where he came from, but he, he moved around a little bit. He was actually, he got brought to the Gracie Academy. Uh, Hoist is actually who, who brought him there. Uh, Hoist is who signed his paperwork. If I, if I remember right, it was Hoist actually signed his, I've, I've his paperwork to right. bring him there. And then... When, when, like, I guess Hickson, Hickson kind of factioned out, you know, and did his own thing. Uh, Luis went with Hickson. He was in, in Brazil before the Gracie, there was a, a Gracie, before there was a Gracie Academy in America, Luis was training with um, uh, Holes Gracie. And he got his brown belt under Holes. And he got his black belt, Holes died in 82. And he got his black belt uh, from Hickson and Alio. They both gave him, awarded him his black belt. Um, that's legit. That's like original. You trained with Holes, man. You, that Holes was the Hickson of Hickson of, of the time. Hickson kind of filled Holes' shoes, right? And it's you could debate all day long about who is better. You'll never know. Is there a video on him competing? Or I don't think so. I don't. Think, all I've ever seen is pictures. I did see. Uh, there is a video of Holes and Hickson rolling uh, that I've seen. A black and white video at some old school somewhere. Um, yeah, I haven't seen much. Yeah. I think there's one video. If I remember right, there's a video of him and Hickson rolling. I believe so. But uh, Sorry. so uh, Luis came here. I started. I asked Hoy. You know, I was the time I was with Hoy. I said, "Do you mind if I start cross training with Luis?" Because that was awesome. Like, you know, that level of knowledge here. You know, I was like, "I'll start. I'll start going there all the time." And then he was rolling with uh, Caesar and Pedro, which uh, C Caesar was the predecessor to Pedro. Right? Caesar was bigger and stronger and older than Pedro. And they grew up training with Crone and Henner and Heaton. You know, they were yeah. they were the kids all training together. This has been their job their whole life. Pedro and and you know Caesar at the time. This was this was it. This is all they'd ever done. Every night of their lives they trained jujitsu. And and Pedro and Caesar were getting it just like, you know, they're that third generation. They're yeah. that they're, no, they're right there with them. I'm so jealous of that. Like um, it's it's funny because I even heard about like little spats, you know, fights they almost got into amongst each other. You know, little like the Gracies youngsters? versus the Paul Harris's. Yeah, like, kind of like shit going down. But anyway, um, not my business to get into that. Sure, no. But but you know they had their arguments, right? There was some there was some um, you know. Is there any lineage uh, connection between the the Paharas? Um, no, Husamar. Mm -hmm. No, not no. I asked, and I'm, no, there's not. Just curious. Um, Random question. But anyway. I, I used to make it over there more. See, when I started training with Luis, I had my own company. The company was successful. I didn't have to, you know, if I, did, I didn't have to work. I, I could work when I wanted. I, I kind of built up to that point. And uh, I trained with Luis often enough. When I lost my IT company, I had to start working for myself. Um, I took an 8 to 5 job a couple years ago. And I lost it because I used to go with Luis all the time, we go train the JSO together. We, you know, we, we actually used to train together as much as I should have, as, as much as I was supposed to. When I started working IT and not having a, I don't have an assistant instructor in the school. If I had one, it would be Jason. But when Jason gets back, his wife wants to spend all this time with him, you yeah. know. And, and I understand nothing, you know. But he's not really, you know. He'll, he'll offer to do mornings, but it didn't really help me in the evenings, you know. Um, I need to be out training with Luis. I feel like there's a rift, you know, between our schools. Our schools shouldn't be called our schools. It should be called our school. You know, mm -hmm. it, they should be coming over here. We should be going over there. It you should be free. Patch, though. Like I, yeah. I heard like I heard a couple of our students were yeah. there and it was like you gotta yeah, have I had to borrow a, a, a gi because mine didn't have a patch and it's like 
and then you don't want to borrow a gi. Like, you yeah, know those nasty stuff is on there. You don't know if it's clean. Not saying that they're not clean at that school. I'm just saying like you don't you don't know. Yeah. And you I, don't have, I have I have a gi with with a patch because I went to the, the seminar, but I and I don't know. It, just, it has to be a white gi. Right. Right. Yeah. right. So I don't know. It's you know, one of those things we should talk about amongst those who want to cross train is, is get, just make sure you have what you need to have so you can go there. So I reach out to the guys on the on the team that I'm, I've reached out to Pedro and I reach out to Stuart and I reach out to Colin and I reach out to the guy, uh, Jason Backlund. I say, guys, come out here, share your technique. Like I know, I know the schools, for, like we work on our stuff, right? Every, every school has its specialty. What they, what they don't work on over there is leg attacks. We work on leg attacks. Uh, I don't think they work on, you know, triple threat back attack system. I don't think they work. There's, there's, there's things that we work on that they, they're on, they're on other things, other level things, right? And if we combine this knowledge, um, God, would be, would be better, you know, we, we would be better. But, you know, like, I'm, I've, I remember I've talked to me and Pedro were in Europe. Um, that was kind of cool. Got to hang, we, we went and, we went and competed um, in, in Zurich, Switzerland for the Zurich Open. But I remember talking to them about leg attacks, and I was like, man, why don't you get on the leg attack wagon? I'm like, imagine how, you'd be, you'd be fucking deadly, man. Like, cause it's his only, it's his only, you know, I don't want to say a hole, because I've never seen anyone get hold of Pedro's legs. Right, he's good at defending, right? Oh, oh I did see him fighting off that one foot lock, right? That one, uh, he, it looked like he was gonna snap, man. Yeah, he, but, and he got out of recently. it. He got out of it. Um, <laughs> But he's not on that nasty. He's not on that leg attack. He, you know, he he was brought up IBJJF, you know, and that's that's the path he chose, right? He was, he chose the IBJJF path. But I just think that's a whole. Like I think you should love, you should embrace everything of grappling. You should embrace sambo. You should embrace wrestling. You should embrace all these things. I don't embrace wrestling because I'm not help. I I can't physically. It's an impossibility to me. If I if I could go back. I would have taken wrestling in high school. I would I would learn everything I could about wrestling, but um, man, I just it's not even an option for me at my age. It's not with with my physicality. It's not an option. I try to get those guys in here. I want like Stewart to come in here and teach Nikki and you guys how to you know how to have a wrestling game. Well, last time we talked, November 9th, we should see Stewart back. Not sure if that's yeah solid. Yeah, that was a great class he had. <clears throat> that was fun. Yeah, he's got. Um, He's got magic from every position. He's got, I remember I would show him things and then like a month later he'd, he, he was like Jason. He, he, anything I showed him, he expanded threefold. Jason's like that. So what happens with Jason is, as I started teaching Jason, Jason started teaching me. I would teach Jason, you know, triple threat. My triple threat had evolved, had evolved a little bit. Like every six months, I'd figure something else to add on, you know. And then I teach Jason the triple threat, and then he goes out there researching everything, and he comes back, and it's, it's, it's morphed into something totally new. Like, like Jason, he may not be as good as the guys doing at EBI, but holy shit, he's learned every single entry imaginable, and he's learned, you know. And you couple that on with me really drilling in the fundamentals of, and he's he's pretty lethal with it. You know, yeah. he pretty much. Um, he's, he's pretty good at it. Um, he's going to be, there's some people that are like savants of jujitsu. Jason's one of those guys that it just, he's good at it. Some people are good at music, you know, we're all, we're all capable of being great at jujitsu. But like, if I, I if so. I look back in history, um, you know, Julian and Julian and, uh, Jason stick out. And then next to them, you know, similarly, um, Ray and Colin stick out. And, Hen and Henry as well. Henry, if I look at all the ones, I mean, you say they stick out. You can easily surpass the other through training, right? Like, just, just, you can push past the other one through, through training. But all of them have the same thing. They just quit training for long periods of time. Like, Ray quit training years ago. Um, Julian took a lot of time off. Um, um, <clears throat> Henry took a lot of time off. Henry probably took like three years off. You know, there's probably like three years he didn't train. He's just now starting to be regular again. Mm -hmm. If he had trained those three years, oh my gosh, man! He had said that he he took a break for a little while, and because he was kind of getting frustrated with it and wasn't moving. He said when he came back, he was actually even stronger and had had better rolls. 
Um, he had mentioned that, but <clears throat> he didn't say how long he stopped for. Yeah, I don't know. It may uh, seem that way in his head, but the reality of it is, you, you can't take three years off and get better. You don't. You don't. You know, anything. Yeah. yeah, you, yeah. Don't, you yeah. don't. I mean, it, it may feel that way. It may feel like you made him. Yeah. Maybe like, your body healed. That's about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you. You would be better. He would have been better. You know. But at the same time, it's like, do we need to be better? You know. Is he in a fight? Yeah, well, who's gonna beat him? You know, it's like you're gonna have to be like a world champion black belt to beat Henry. You're gonna have to be like a, you know, you're gonna have to be. So, as far as why he started training, he's reached that goal. He doesn't need yeah, to be has the best, motivators. right? We all have different motivators. So it's like for me to look back and go, ah, oh, if he had kept kept training. But you look at people like Ray, or you look at and, and Ray's like, I can do what I set out to do. I, I reached my goal. Like, why am I still training, right? Like, my, I, I just had one thing. I just said, I want to be a black belt. I want to be able to do what Hoist Gracie did, you know, in the, in the ring. What's and your goal, Brendan? Whoa, on the spot there. Yeah, I have a goal. Do you? Yeah. I, I mean, why did you join? I mean, that, well, that's not a fair question. Everybody joined. Uh, what is your goal? You joined for whatever reason, but what, what do you want out of it? What I want out of it, I don't, I don't know. I mean, my goal, the goal, what, I guess, would be would be become a black belt, and right. be able to be able to teach. What are the odds? What odds are you giving yourself of being a black belt? Ten uh, percent. You only giving yourself ten percent odds? No, hundred percent. Honestly, honestly, be you, honest. What do you what do you honestly think your odds are of becoming a black belt? Be on one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Like honestly, because and, and my, my I think my fear though is because listen your your lineage and listen to other people talk. They go from school to school to school to school, I, or they went to a couple schools. Like I don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> I want to stay here. I want to get my black belt under you. You know, what, and, um, and 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 what? Why do I think I'm gonna do that? Is because by far 100 percent, this is the best thing I've ever done in my life. Um, beyond just. The knowledge that I'm getting, the confidence, um, the exercise, the camaraderie, the people I'm meeting, no, people I'm, are great, the, the, the life-mindedness, um, the fun I have. Uh, I wish I would have done it 10, oh, okay. 20 years earlier, right? I wish because the, the moment I watched the first UFC that I ever watched, I was like, holy crap, who are these dudes in Brazil? Like, how can I get a plane ticket over to Brazil to train with them? When, when Actually, that wasn't it in, at all. They like lived in L.A. and they brought it here, <laughs> right? <clears throat> and I wasn't far from L.A. at the time when I was in. But, but whatever. My life didn't take me down that path. I, I did something else. Uh, but I'm here now. Um, I don't honestly. There's there's days, and I'll be on, quite honest with anybody listening, you guys. Um, I, I get into like a, a depressed state where I feel like shit, and you know what bounces me right back? Jiu-jitsu. Rolling. Up. Yeah, rolling, yeah. getting better, uh, days out drinking, spending way too much money than I want to, and, and feeling like crap after. Uh, the, the exercising and coming here and rolling with you guys and having a couple laughs brings my attitude up and just reminds, okay, I need to get back in the fucking, I need to roll with you guys, I need to have some fun. Um, and, and and getting better, too. Like, seeing the progression and talking to the guys, the little belts that I roll with, too, like, just saying, man, hey, from the first day you walked into now, like, your your game, your jiu-jitsu is getting better. better. The cool um, thing is you all become the new leaders. Like, that, that that's what's really cool. It's like in a in, – in very shortly, you guys are going to be – there's going to be a whole new group looking up to you guys, you know. But I'm not like, the dude, future. My don't, kid don't, is the future. Like, I want yeah. my daughter in here, like, wrecking shop, and I want her to be a no. fighter. You, you know, Nikki, I want them to be fighters. Like, I, I'm an old fucking guy, right? But but I can still see myself be, being black belt and like like Steven, right? Being like I could, yeah, I'm gonna do this shit. Yeah. I, I feel like I want to do this shit so I'm eight years old. Yeah, what to be you, honest. What about you, Tom? What's your goal? You know, I, I don't know that I have a goal necessarily as far as like belt level, but uh, it, it's just it's something that that is gonna be a part of my life from here on out. You know what I mean? And so that's my goal is to just. Keep doing it. Keep improving. You know. Yeah, I'm like not gonna be said, done when I'm black belt. No, that's but not I, the, yeah, I, yes, and, and, and I'm not there. gonna be disappointed if I don't get to black belt. Right. But, I, you I know, don't part, care. part I of don't like you said, the camaraderie, the the exercise, the learning. I'm, I'm one of those people that always has to be learning something. I'm not. I can't just sit sedentary. You know. So, uh, for me, it's 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 just this ultimate chess match with billions of possible endings. It's 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 very intriguing to me to keep learning. You know, one of my goals is to be able to just keep teach my son and for him to be good. You know, but. Uh, yeah, it's just future. something. It's just something that you know. It's it, it's. Uh, I'm kind of disappointed myself that 
that I, I kind of got away from martial arts and just kind of started focusing on my career and, and other things and, and not as much on myself. You know, I'm, I'm sad that it took me this long to get back into it, you know, but it's just something I just want to be a, just to, for it to be a part of my life and, and, you know, the exercise and learning and getting better every day, you know, I mean, I've only been here a month and I feel like I've, you know, from the first time we rolled to the last, like I just, I can see huge improvements and that just, you know, it's like you said, it just cheers you up and yeah. makes you makes you feel good man it's it's mm -hmm. killer but there's times i go home and I'm like, god i'm fucking suck you know, you know, i know right you know, yeah you're like, god yeah. man yeah and but one roll go back the, the next, next day you know? and i was like wow i i, I did yeah, pretty like, good did you today. see that move i pulled off like right. it's just yeah. it's, it's great i passed jason's guard <laughs> but what about you actually you're, you're only 30 so i mean you're you're into this a lot younger than than we are so where do you see yourself going with this or do you do you have goals that you set for yourself i have a goal you're gonna um, be blue belt in like 86 86 you know i'm competitive like i'm super competitive and the fact that there's a rank rank structure in jiu-jitsu that makes it that more more competitive for me um i did crossfit for a long time when it, not when it first came popular and once i was in i was all in you know i was competing i was doing good i was trying to get like a part of a team and I, but what I found out I like doing was actually teaching. Like I like teaching other people, like the Olympic lifts, like how to get a muscle up, um, you know, just training. I like training. And then I, I, the main reason why I came to jiu-jitsu was to make friends because I was getting out of the Navy and whatnot. And because I was in the Navy, you know, there was a rank structure there. It was competitive move up in rank. I'm loyal. And I found this place. I fell in love with this place. I like my coach a lot. And I, I want to be a black belt. I do. And I will be a black belt um, because I have a really bad – habit when i do something i either do it for like i want to be the best at it or i'm, I'm not even gonna bother like skeet shooting like yeah. when i started skeet shooting I, I wanted to be the best and i was hitting i want to hit the perfect score i want to hit 100 out of 100 and i got to 97 out of 100 which is really good and i still skeet shoot but you know skeet shooting was fun but this actually has applications in my life that it's gonna make me a better like respect i already have respect but you're more respectful i like coaching the kids um, I want to coach adults one day. I, I want. I like coaching. I like teaching. Uh, the Navy was a instructor, so I, I, I want to be a black belt. That, yeah, that is something I should have mentioned as a goal is to get good enough to where I can help teach the kids yep. and yeah. stuff like that. So, it's something I've always enjoyed. One of the things, um, the most important thing in, in your path to jujitsu, and I'll, and I'll, I think this needs to be said, is that you enjoy where you're training. So many people don't realize that how different the environments can be they they really have no idea and it's it's kind of shitty because when you've spent any amount of time with your instructor um i'd say beyond two months maybe three months or just when, when you've created a bond well however long that takes different for different people but when you consider him your instructor and you've let him feel like you've kind of told him oh yeah you're my instructor you know i love it here whatever it hurts his feelings when you leave and go somewhere else. So you need to find out first if there's if you enjoy where you're training, you're already good. If you, if you're like, man, I like it here, I like it's good. But some people continue training at places because they want that end result. They're like, I want to be a black belt, but they don't really like like going to class. It's like, man, I don't want to go, but I want that black belt. But yeah. oh, it's like I don't want to do that thing tonight that I got to do. You know, there's that thing I got to do, and maybe it's the fucking hundred muscle you know whatever you know jump squats or whatever yeah. you know i wanted to make it to where it was no part that someone didn't like that way the journey is easy yeah. i'm going to turn out the same quality but the journey is going to be it, it can be an easy journey it doesn't have to be a hard journey it can be a fun journey actually it should be a fun journey the the if it's not fun why the hell would you put yourself through it right I, that's, I think that's how Alia wanted it. That's how he and Henner want it. Keep it playful. It should be a fun journey. One of the things I do with the kids, and I know sometimes adults don't quite understand. Sometimes I say stuff and adults are like, it's fucking weird. <laughs> I know that. I understand that. You know, the other day I used an example. Like, I was like, yeah, I don't think, you know, what's, they asked, like, you know, what's better, a red belt or a black belt? And I had to equate that to a blue belt and me, you know, Craig and me. And I was like, I don't think Craig, I might have could have said it better, but I was like, I don't think Craig could beat someone up. I don't think I can beat someone up better than Craig could. You know, like, untra you know, it's, we're beyond blue belt. We're, forget that conversation because I'd, I'd really have to go in to explain that. My point is this. It's my job to make jujitsu two things when I'm teaching kids. Fun and mystical. That, that's my job. 
it's not necessarily for the parents to be completely logical for the parents at all times. What's more important is that the kid was like, wow. And then they had fun. Because it's, all I have to do is keep them here and they'll get to black belt. Actually, all I gotta do is get them to blue belt and they have a pretty good chance of getting the black belt. Most kids will drop off because you, like, the instructors push them hard. You have these world champion schools and they're trying to teach the kids like, they're, like they trained. Like, well, don't you wanna be a world champion? It's like, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta push them. And that, let that be the kid's choice. Maybe he does not wanna be a world champion. What are the odds I got 30 world champions in here? Probably not. No. Chances are most of them are there to learn how to protect themselves. So I just got to keep them there. That's all I got to do. So if I can tell them, man, you're learning a superpower. This is mystical. If you just get to blue belt, you can, you can, no one can, you know, and is there a slight bit of exaggeration? Yes, but that's my job. My job is to keep the kids there and make it fun. If I do that, I've served those kids right because they will come to class every day and they will get better, sooner, faster. They will stay longer, they'll reach that pinnacle that they may not have otherwise reached. So that's how Alio did it. Alio did not push his kids. He let them choose if they wanted to. That's why lots of, lot, there's plenty of, the, the, most of the girls didn't train. Like, you know, there's, there's all these Gracies that, that just didn't train. Like on the, on the female side, a lot of them didn't train. And um, he didn't push them to train. And he instead he rewarded them. Like if you if you won a if you won a tournament, you got the trophy. But if you lost, he gave you like twenty hay eyes or something. It's like I did that I, with Samuel. I, I see kids yelling at their at their. I see parents yelling at their kids. Bridge, bridge. Yeah, bridge. We remember that. And, yeah. and then scolding you remember them for that? losing. Yeah. And then like yeah. saying, you know, I knew you were gonna lose to this. You know, and it's just like, oh, it's so frustrating. Cause it's like, man, your kids fighting with honor. They're out there. Yeah. It's some kids are terrified. You know. It's no different from a kid than it is for an adult. How many times have you stepped on the mat as an adult and your kid's stepping out there every weekend? You know, like every, you, you line it up and they're, they're proud to go out there and do honor. For, them, for you to think that that other kid isn't getting similar training, and they have just as good of odds. Your kid's going to become great if they stick with it. But if you keep getting in their ass, they're not going to enjoy it and they're not going to stick with it. All you, if you want your kid to be great, don't expect them to be a champion every time at six or seven years old. Just try to get them to stay with it. If you, if you can just get them to stay with it, they're going to be phenomenal because they'll have other kids are going to drop off. They're going to get pushed too hard. They're going to take a year off. Maybe take it. Maybe take the rest of their life off. They're going and this is going to be a habitual circle. Keep it fun. Make sure they they love it. Make sure they enjoy. It. Always when they compete, tell them, man, that was fucking awesome. Did you, that takedown was wicked, bro. You got to make them. Love jujitsu, and that's how you do it. And that's so with the new breed. I, I I text you, I emailed you, whatever before thinking like, what do you think about Sam? Because Sam only, can only train when he's here with me, yeah. and he trains here. And um, you said, yeah, I think if he wants to. So I I, I called him. I'm like, hey, you, I'm I'm competing. Do you want to compete? He said no off the bat. No, I'm not ready. I'm like, all right. I, but he said no because he didn't want to let me down. Like he, I don't want I don't want to lose that and embarrass you. Like look, if you lose, I'll give you twenty bucks. Right, I'll give you twenty dollars if you lose. You can use it for Fortnite. I don't care. If you win, you get a medal. He's like, well, do I have to win first? I'm like, if you want, sure. Like, well, what if I win first, second, third? You keep your money. I'll be happy with the medal. If I don't win any medals, then fine. I'll do the twenty bucks thing. Sweet. So I'm like, do you want to do gear, no gear, both? He said both. So his buy forty bucks. Right. So he actually lost the first one. Like he doesn't like no gi. I don't like. It. Well, he never practices no gi, right? Um, so he lost, so he's like, you know that I'll, I'm only gonna charge you ten dollars for losing. Like, but, but I wasn't mad, you know. I I was more nervous than yeah. he was. You know, my son's out there your first time, but he loved it. He did a good chance. And then the gi, you know, he went with gi. He fought the same, obviously the same exact people he fought before, and he ended up getting silver. He got silver, and then oh man, he was so happy. But like exactly what you said, like seeing other parents yelling, I was as happy that he was out there. Yes. And then I didn't want him like get mad. He was more worried about disappointing me than he was losing. Yeah. And I told him like, man. You already won. Like, you know how many kids are, like, how many kids go to school and they don't compete? You know, like, you're either going to get better or you're going to win. One of those two things are going to happen. And he was, he called his friends. He was so happy. But I made, I wanted to be positive. He lost his first two matches, I there's, think. There's, 
And that's what, like, you know, like, I'm so proud of you, dude. Like, yeah. oh, my that's gosh. How, that's how you got to be. There's, there's kids that go out there and get silver, and their parents fucking ream their asses that's for so it. Like, lame. like, I knew yeah, you were going to lose geez. that kid. I knew, And it's just like, oh, my God, you, you're killing your kids. Enjoy, you're going to make them hate the sport. And they're, they're going to be, once they're old enough to make up their own mind, they're done. You there's don't a lot of it, stupid ass hate. parents out there. I think I'm one of the world's greatest dads. I really do. And and my, I mean, my son told me that, so it must be true, you know. Yeah. He's not you have biased. A coffee cup. Yeah, yeah. 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 he's not yeah. biased at all. Yeah. But I mean, like it's it's like training a dog. You know, if a dog does something wrong, you're not gonna beat his ass if you're trying to teach him something, because then this dog's never gonna want to learn how to do it again. Yeah. Now, like if he's trying his best, like Samuel, not my dog now, and he's like he's trying, he's willing to put in the work. Great, you know. But if he pisses in the toaster, then yeah, you're gonna get grounded. You know not to piss in the toaster. But like, no, you're not gonna yell at kid because he got silver. I'm not, and then you got bronze. Who pisses in a toaster? That's no a one, right? But you know that's weird. That's not a do. that's not a rule. But everybody knows not to piss in a toaster. Isn't that weird? Okay. Yeah, I don't think people understand how uh, fragile a kid's psyche oh, is super, and, and how dude. much um, our opinion means to them. They're so worried about We're disappointing the only opinion us. That matters. It's just yeah. so important to be like, hey man, no matter what happens today, I'm proud of you. You know, I mean, it's all about attaboys and pats sure. on the back. And, I mean, Positive they're, reinforcement, they're, they're yeah. Eight, they're 10 years old. Who cares if you lose? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you're out here competing. And that Dude, my daughter balls, makes the ugliest so drawings. I'm so proud of you, you know? And, and, <laughs> and I, love I grew up playing sports, and so many parents are so awful, and they're so hard on their kids. And running out on the football field, grabbing their, you know, 12-year-old son by the face mask and throwing him on the that's, ground and screaming at him. That doesn't work. Because they missed a tackle. Yeah. I'm like, we're in seventh grade. You've got to be kidding me. No. You know, you're, look, first off, your kid's never going to the fucking NFL, okay? You're not getting a meal ticket here, motherfucker. And that's what it's like. Everyone wants to be Tiger Woods' dad or something. Yeah. It's like, let them be kids, you know? Love your kid yeah. and be supportive. That's so, all that matters. As a leader you know? in the Navy, like, I didn't, I thought yelling at someone for messing up, people shut down, you know? I got, I got my ass chewed all the time. And I, like, I, I get to a point like, you're not going to punch me. I'm not grounded. You know, this ass chewing is going to end. What breaks my heart when my leader, my boss, would be like, man, you disappointed me. I, I thought. Right. Worst thing. Bro, that's where. And then that's how I feel every time I lose a match. I'm like, fuck, I just let coach down. I don't care about losing. I, just, I don't want to let coach no, down. No, it didn't bother me a bit. I don't. What? It bothers me. So I was like, I don't. But, like if you, but if you would come out of me and start yelling at me, oh, you fucking suck, then in my mind, I'm going to start being like, whatever. Like, I'll start like coming up excuses. But you coming at me saying, hey, man, good job, good try, good effort, great. Then that like that just makes me want to be better. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Like, be like, ah, oh, you could have done. Not that you you never said that. I'm saying like, hey, great job. It's just positive reinforcement makes me. All right, you know what? I'm gonna do. I'm going to do better. Opposed to like, like you're saying, oh, you. How did you miss that ground ball? Piece of crap. And like, well, fuck, I'll just miss all the ground balls now. Yeah. You shut down. Yeah, you do. You and do. then the kids stop caring. Yeah, and I think another thing, you know, coming out here and doing it yourself, you know, like my son originally, he'd get real you know, sad that if, if he lost a match in front of me, you know, and, and then, you know, he did it for a few months before I joined up, and then he's like, oh, he's all bummed, you know, I got tapped out, and it's like, well, I went to practice this morning, you know, how many times I got tapped out? Yeah. Well, did you lose today? Yeah, seven fucking <laughs> times I got tapped out, okay? Every person in this gym can kick my ass. How's that, right? You know, I'm, I'm his big, tough dad who's, you know, toughest guy in the world. No, I'm not. Like, I suck. And it's okay not to be good because you know what? I'm learning, yeah. Yeah. and I'm gonna get good, and I'm getting better, and that's all yeah. that matters. It doesn't take know? long. It takes like somewhere between six months and a year. Your 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 game goes. That's when you take your biggest gains, yeah. right? Like your your biggest gains are white to blue. Everything above that is nominal. It's like so white to blue, you're gonna make all this ground, and then blue to purple, you're gonna grow like this much, and then purple to brown like this much. Like Henry at purple and Henry at brown are pretty much the same Henry. And Henry at Blue is yeah. a just nightmare for anyone that isn't <laughs> yeah, in jiu -jitsu. No, no, seriously, yeah, like, for sure. But, but he still had a little bit to learn, but it's like, you know, Blue Belt, you're like already 90% or 80 I mean, I don't want to say that. Like, there's people going to be disagree with me, but it's the biggest leap you can take. You, like, Blue Belt's a threat. Blue Belt's catch black belts once in a while. Yeah. Once in a while, a white belt will catch. Like, here's how I get caught by a white belt. A white belt comes into school. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, this guy knows nothing, so I treat them like a total, like a total, no possibility of winning, right? And it, it, it it's happened a few times. It, did you get me as a white? You, you did, yeah. I, well, how was it? The so I, I went for the Kimura, and I choked you out with my legs. So you knew something. Did you know something? Is that what it was? Like you, you knew. My something. dad trained a little bit, and then he showed me stuff. Yeah. So what happened is, Alex comes in, 
and I assume he knows nothing, right? And I totally disrespect his jujitsu. Like I'm just like fucking around with him, like on a stupid level. And all of a sudden, he pulls off some shit that I didn't expect him to know, right? So I'm like, oh shit! Now I'm like, all right. Of course, then I'm like, all right, motherfucker. Now, now you got to, now you got to get me at a ten, you know? So whatever. I got to get payback, you know? So <laughs> I got to make sure I earn respect and show that I'm a black belt, whatnot. And uh, and I got to turn it up the next few rolls, you know? That's what ha- that's what has to happen, right? But it's happened a few times, like. It, it happens to guys because, um, which resulted in a rule. Actually, I think, so this is what changed. Actually, I think, I think it, was, it was you that caught me, and I hadn't been caught by a white belt in a, a long time. It, 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 it had been, oh, did you ever catch me? No. I got you twice. I got you, you put me in a body triangle one time, remember, and I locked your leg, and I pushed on your hip, and, that, and I showed you something. So you had my back control, you put me in a body triangle, the leg that's hanging, I kind of locked it with my right foot, and then I pushed on your opposite knee, and then you tapped. And you said that was the first time that's ever happened because targeted usually, his injuries. You have to roll over. <laughs> oh yeah, to do yeah, that yeah. Move. You did it well without me moving. Yeah, yeah. You did it without tr- falling on the leg and trapping it right. Yeah. You did the the, the footlock from there. But so what happened is after that is it used to be white belts came in, and I I kind of just rolled with them, you know, like as white belts and figure, oh, they don't know nothing. But once in a while, a white belt comes in and he knows something, right? So I said, all right, well, from now on, I'm just going to start mopping the mats with every white belt that comes in. If I roll, the first time I roll with someone, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat them like a black belt. I'm just going to, I'm just going to crush them because I don't want any mistake happening where I lose credibility with that student, right? So as a result, I've been, I've just been to the point that sometimes I feel bad. Like someone will come in and I got to explain to him, look, I, bro, I got to, I gotta treat you like, because uh, you may leave here and do a write up on me, and you know if I if I treat you if I if I'm too nice to you, yeah. you might go home and s- write up in Google. Hey, well, isn't that impressive, right? So from I now think on, I noticed that like, the other day with, my our, next with our new guy. From the first time we rolled. <laughs> from the first time. So the new guys come in. If if you're new and you come in now, the first roll up, I've, I've got. I understand now. Like, it's. And then after that, it's okay. Then then we can play. Then we can. But the first time, I have to show you that this is what my jujitsu is capable of, right? So, um, but it's interesting. Yeah, like we're not we're not untouchable. There, I, there's no black belt out there. This I disagree. If you want to tell me you're untouchable, I, I just I disagree with you. Anyone can make a mistake. Just like Luis says, jujitsu is not perfect. All you got to just make one mistake, and that guy capitalizes on it. Not, you know, the odds of that happening may be slim. But the more you roll, the more chances of it are happening, right? Some luck into something. Yep. Yeah. So um, I think uh, we're at we're at three o'clock. That's a long that's a long one. But I think we should close out with some conspiracy talk. Like I think <laughs> I I think. I'm just gonna close out. All right, guys, have a great no, weekend. No, I think we should nice spend Sunday. ten minutes. Ten. I think we should spend ten minutes because. I feel it's my duty. <laughs> I feel it's my duty to let people know that we live on a flat earth. Oh. I do. Okay. I want to hear your... We'll convince I wanna, them. No, I want to hear... Well, first off, where, where, where do you stand, Alex? Where do you stand on flat earth versus spherical earth? I say uh, neither can be proved, and I'm going to believe the lesser popular because that's what people don't want us to believe, if that makes sense. I mean, we can't prove it. The, was it the ISS doesn't hover high enough to get a full picture even if like even if what we're seeing is real photos um i don't believe we went to the moon i don't believe we're going to space and i feel like the reason behind that is religion people just lying to see so i don't think the earth is flat but i don't think it's round and i'm going to lean to the lesser of the two evils you're going egg shaped i'm going to go uh, it's believable like the bible talks about the earth being like stationary you know if you're gonna believe the bible you have to believe the bible. Obviously, you know, that's fine. That's cool. But I do. So I can't just, it's not a buffet. It's also cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. I can't pick and choose what I want to believe. This is my absolute truth. This is my absolute truth. Um, well, that being said, like, is it possible the other's flat? Yeah. We believed it forever. Why? And then now we don't because, you know, people told us it's not true. So I don't know, but I don't, I don't believe. That it, I don't know. It just round doesn't make sense. Pour water on a tennis ball. No, I'm joking. But it just doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> what, where, where's your stance, Brendan? Any possibility the Earth is the is the is the it's Earth? possible? I don't I don't believe it is, but it's possible. What do you believe though? I've done that the it's research round? on the on the flat Earth. I just believe what you know. <laughs> well, it's funny because everyone I've ever heard talk about it, I I, I thought they were joking. 
<laughs> I've never really put much thought or, or, I, yeah, I haven't or research down, into it. Research. You know? I've never so. done any studies. I've never been on a rocket. You know, I've never went into low Earth orbit. We should we should all uh, all know. the videos I've seen of the ISS it, it's it looks shady. They, they all look shady. L let's like let's pass a hat around and we'll get uh, Bobby a trip around the world. You know, a, a continuous gotcha. flight. Right? He's gonna go from Jacksonville and just fly the. No, you gotta go that to wouldn't do anything. Out. That no. would improve anything. It wouldn't, it wouldn't improve. improve. How would it what not? I don't get is how there, there's people out there saying that Australia doesn't exist. So West I've been to Australia. Think about this. <laughs> That's the shit that drives me. I've never up. heard that either. <laughs> West and East. You're thinking about it as a globe. Think of West and East as a clock. Oh, okay. So you'd have to go north, south. North, south. Okay. Well, you know, whichever direction the plane is. But you can't go south on you and I farted. It's it's blocked. Yeah. <laughs> All <laughs> governments in the world block north, uh, north, south, and circumnavigation via the Antarctic Treaty. And on, There's a treaty yeah, that was treaty. signed for like 40 or 60 years by 53 countries that said the treaty can't be revisited. It says. It was signed, I think, in between so you're not allowed and to fly over Antarctica. No, no. It's, and that would no. be the wall. That would be the. That, that would shady? be the. Is that Trump's wall? <laughs> <laughs> that would be the. So you got to have an open mind. Let's talk about it for a minute. No, I Let's. For, I want. I want to say this. So where do you stand on spherical Earth? Obviously, I, I, like I said, I, I've not put uh, in any research or thought into it. I assumed it's round. I, I don't really have any reason to believe it's not. You know, but. Uh, I, I like the stance of question everything, you know, so uh, I, I respect it for sure. Um, I, 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 at this point, definitely have to say that, you know, I, I believe it is round. It doesn't make much sense for the... For Jason. Uh, why so, they can, why everybody so spend all the time and money to, to lie about it, it but who knows? I'm going to answer some of those questions real quick. I'm going I'm, I'm to take a few questions. We'll try to keep it at like five, maybe ten minutes at the most, but I, I like... I, I like talking about flat earth and for me this is an opportunity and everyone so they can shut down now if they're, if they're done with the jiu-jitsu portion you can um because the remainder of the podcast is going to focus on flat earth which may be five or ten minutes and not gay porn not gay porn so that's under the table so here's the thing let's let's look at um first off do you think we went to the moon uh, another thing I never really thought much of. I'll, I'll tell you this: it would not surprise me a single bit if that was a lie, because yeah, I, so I just we don't have trust we our have government. We have, oh, I we don't trust our media. We, we absolutely have. I, I have really wondered, like, well, then why did we quit? Well, you know, we what I lost mean? the technology. Yeah, we yeah, I heard it. that. What, what, what do you mean you lost the technology? Uh, Jason wants me to tell you that the Earth is round. <laughs> You're gonna pay for that shit, fucker. <laughs> I was so mad I couldn't respond. And the trajectory I blew it, I blew it is fuse. erased too. It's gone. That's Not really. So flight. And, and they can't figure it out so, again. They they did it in right. what the '60s right. and they can't you do it now. I mean, the come technology on. Today to, to, yeah. I can download porn on but, my phone. But if you look at like 1950, whatever, no, 1960, I don't know, 69, 60, 60 something, 61 or 65 or something. Oh. It's like the Ed White spacewalk. I used to know the year. But fucking my memory's shit. But let's look at Ed White. He does this spacewalk, right? It's it's fucking stop motion. It's, it's fake as shit. It's stop motion. A fucking gardening glove fucking floats off into space. Um, he Actually, rotates his helmet. Yeah, the helmet. You can't rotates. do that. It's, that's absolutely impossible. We know. We don't even do that in sci-fi. Like, <laughs> like sci-fi directors know you can't do that. No, it'd have a leak, bro. You can't. It'd, it'd have to be on like bearings and shit. You can't turn the helmet, bro. You can't do There's that. There's no need for it to steal. turn. Your head yeah. just floats right. inside. So... And then, yeah, you turn your head, not yeah. the helmet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, but they turned the helmet. Turn. It, it was stop motion. It was fucking claymation, stop motion, fucking bullshit, right? right. And sure. people think we've been to the moon. People think that we landed on the moon, and the president of the United States called and had <laughs> a fucking 10-minute conversation. It was like, hey, what's going on? Y'all are doing a good job. Yeah, hey, thanks a lot. Yeah, we're just having a conversation at 238,000 miles away. This technology is completely untested. People, the studies, like I've been, I've spent hundreds of hours studying all this stuff, and like the LEM doesn't even have an explanation for the for powering an antenna that could do this. Like th it's absolutely not done. You couldn't fly the space shuttle. They claim it's a glider, but it has a jet engine. Every time it he you hear it go, you hear the jet engines slowing down, stopping the plane. Right? You hear, you hear it. Um, it's clearly a jet engine when it's coming in. Also, if you look at the SR-71, which was, I don't know what year that was retired, around, around late 80s, early 90s, something like that, the Blackbird. 
the Blackbird, if you were to look up some videos on that, it leaks fuel tremendously. Like when it stops, it's like, like fucking profusely leaking fuel. It does this because at high altitude, they cannot find a way. Uh, and this is on like National Geographic. You can't even argue with it. So here you got Lockheed Martin can't design in the 90s a plane that cannot leak fuel because they have no substance that can uh, deal with the stretching of the, the heat, like stretching the material. Oh, yeah, yeah. So like, the, you know, it's a, it's a, it has wet wings, meaning the, the, the fuel's in the, in the wings, and when they stop, it's leaking fuel profusely. They gotta reseal it all. There's no way um, we went to the moon. I saw the computer that we used on the Apollos. They had, they had, MIT was created by MIT. It was a joke, punch button, like it had literally noun and verb. Now I'm gonna do verb 41, now, this is a joke, this clicky, the whole fucking thing is a joke. The fact that anyone ever thinks, we didn't go to the moon, we never went back, we can't. And then you look like, well, we got ISS. Well, really we don't, there's no ISS. All, the, all, that, fit, all that footage is fake and it's proven. All, it's all green screen and augmented reality, all of it. It looks great though. Some of it. Some of it looks cool. Some of it. The imagery looks great, but when you have the humans in it, like like yeah. floating shit around and yeah. spinning stuff, they fuck it up. Like Transformers looks Old real. Star Trek TV they show. They drop screws. In. Yeah. Yeah. My, Water drips. My conspiracy is evolution. That's one thing I don't buy for a single second. Oh, neither do I. Yeah. And, well, and not, but not because I'm religious, yeah, yeah. but just for different reasons, because it makes no fucking sense at all. Like it. it well, it the, didn't happen. And that's what we know? talk about, like why NASA fake, like even yeah. science, like you know. I, when I went through high school, or actually even high school, younger than that, you know, the Earth was what millions of years old. Now, as an adult, the Earth is billions of years old. Like they don't know. They, they don't know. know. No. And Carbon dating doesn't it, work. No, it doesn't. Well, so in the history of the world, there's never been a single species that has ever evolved into another species. It's never happened. Yeah. Unless you believe in human evolution, right? Also, the primates that we evolved from are still around. If they evolved into us, what the fuck are they doing here, right? Like it, it's. You ever heard of yeah. Dinosaur Park? It's in Texas, early 1900s, some river washed out, and there's dinosaur tracks, and there's human footprints in the same limestone, yeah. right? There's, like, supposed to be 200 million years in between humans and these dinosaurs, right? Yeah. And later, 60s, when we start learning more about dinosaurs, so we think, they excavated a bunch more. Same prints, same human yeah. prints. Yeah, yet know, we have... Like, um, they can't even, they don't even have a theory on how that we could have, be. It's which the Bible talked about us being around... They don't use the word dinosaur because the word dinosaur wasn't discovered or invented until right. later on. But all the creation, like we were around with all of it. Like there wasn't a time before humans in the earth. Like there wasn't dinosaurs. The dinosaurs get wiped out because of a big ass asteroid. And then somehow, you know, life started all over again. Like that doesn't yeah. make sense. Right, right. Yeah. The whole life was snuffed out on the yeah. earth. And how to you know, I, I've seen Armageddon. And they talk about like. You know, if this big ass sized Texas rock comes hits us, you know, nothing will survive. Not even bacteria, because it'll be like a nuclear explosion. So I'm assuming that's what happened. Right, With right. The dinosaurs, it's, it's how the hell? Science thinks, you know? How did it happen? Like, how, like, how did well, you've you got, you got megalithic structures all in, 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 in Mexico and other parts of the world that have dudes sitting on dinosaurs. Yeah. Right? Like, it's like, so A, you've got the tracks with dinosaurs, you've got. Um, I mean, those those things are pretty unex, unexplainable. Yeah, um, it's too much but, pointing to the fact that there's another possibility. I I wish they would teach evolution more as a theory, theory rather than mm-hmm. trying to teach my kid that this is what happened because then he's got to come home and I got to explain to him they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Which you the, know, now, that's kind of. Let, let, go back to the flat Earth for a second. Okay, sorry, I, I railroaded. It, that. Got sorry. three minutes on that. <laughs> <laughs> let's 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 look at something you may not have known. Um, the Earth dips is supposed to, according to science, according to mainstream science, the shit. Well, it actually has to be. You can do the math. A mathematician, any mathematician, can do the math. Um, if the circumference of the Earth is twenty-five thousand miles, it has to dip at eight inches per mile squared. Eight inches. That's not eight inches per mile. It's eight inches per mile squared, and that becomes very, very big. Over five hundred miles. It's like. 31 miles of dip. That's a lot of dip, right? So the easiest thing you can do if you want to understand if the, if the earth is flat around, and I could sit here and talk about, we could talk about everything. We could talk about satellites. We could talk about planets. We could talk about, but the easiest, there's, a, there's explanations for all of this. Measure water. Everyone that measures water 
it measures flat. There has to be there has to be eight inches per mile squared. There are people measuring, you know, 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles. It's perfectly flat. That cannot be. The Earth is predominantly water. The water must wrap around it. It must observe eight inches per mile squared. It must. It, so all these people are going out there today, and they're measuring water. And if the mod, the waters, we can do it. We can. We should. We should go out and just, uh, let's go to. Uh, there's a lake. Uh, uh, there's a lake, Okeechobee. Okeechobee. We can go there. It's thirty something miles across or something. We can measure that shit. We'll measure the fucking water. It's. It's not. We use Craig's boat. Um, yeah, yeah. Or <laughs> um, now it's very easy to do to measure it. All you gotta do is put something on the other side from one side and see if you can see it, okay? Because there should be a certain amount of dip. You can see at what height, do you see Bobby here, here, here? Well, there are people that are seeing at 160 miles, entire, like foundations of buildings, the entire buildings. And then science comes and says, you know, the, there are bazillions of these photos. And science comes and says, and the news says, like people start, it starts making rounds on the it's internet. Science comes and says, well, it's a mirage. It's but mirages are always inverted and wavy. Yeah. These are not inverted, and they're not wavy at all. It's completely fixed. One guy, to prove it wasn't a Rob Skiba, boated away from Chicago over the Great Lakes. He just boated away and left a camera on it. And he's like, tell me when it turns into a mirage. You know, we're going to see it. At what point did it become a mirage? It never went below. So for all these people out there doubting and hating, right? You're not open-minded. You've just been deceived. This is my opinion. I'm not. Nothing's a fact. Nothing. But if you're, I'm telling you, I'm sharing my belief. My belief is that we were deceived, and the Earth is flat as fuck. And just measure it. There are experience. There's experiments you can do. Just measure it. Measure some water. All right. Well, you find the curve in the water. I'll shut up. If someone finds the curve, but there's people all over the world right now that are measuring water, and it's flat. It's perfectly flat. Yeah. You can't explain that. All right, that's it. That was a good conversation. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to end it on that. We're at 10 minutes. <laughs> All right, anything else? Oh, I'm thank done. you guys for having me. It's yeah, fun. no, it was, it was fun. fun. There's, there's been a, a, a small discussion about the jealousy of you being on Did the you show. see that? I, I saw Coach it. Coach can't see because it's, it's on Facebook. Facebook. Sorry, you can't, you can't see, see that, Bobby. Uh, um, Joan's a little upset that Tom got a seat before she did. Yeah, she was like, what did you, I asked her, and she didn't seem like she was really interested. She was like, oh, you hear that, Joan? On. It's all your fault. Sorry, Joan. Yeah. You can be on Apologize. next week, Joan. Laura, Laura was like, fuck that. I'm yeah, Laura, just, I'm just, I'm happy, happy, to hear it. I'm just happy listening. I I'd love to have Joan on. I actually talked to Joan, and she was kind of like blase about it. Like, like she didn't really seem super interested. I was like, hey, would you like to come on? Like, I asked Tom, he's like, yeah, fuck yeah, I'll, I'll come on, it was cool. Right. Right. So there Joe's scared to say no, you, I thought he'd beat me up. <laughs> Joan, don't act so Joan blase. Can be on next, I don't, I don't, I just think it's cool that we get on people who love jiu-jitsu. And uh, that's our family, right? That's our, that's our, that's our, and I like Absolutely. putting, I like letting other people in the jiu-jitsu community know who we are. And, um, and I like letting them know the kind of the crazy shit that I'm into. So uh, with that, we're going to close out, guys. Thanks for joining. Adios. See you next time. Signing off.